It's now 10.30 and so I will start the meeting, the second meeting of the Commission on the Future of Adult Social Care. So good morning everyone and welcome to the meeting. Um, my name is Councillor Val Armstrong, I'm Cabinet Member for Adult Social Care and Public Health and also Councillor for Leitch in Chester. Before we start uh, the meeting, I'd like to just um, remind you of a few things which will help everyone access the meeting. If you're not speaking, please turn your camera off and that will mean that the speaker has full screen and can be easily seen. Uh, try not to use acronyms and abbreviations and speak clearly. And if we can see your shoulders on the screen, it means your um, head and face are fully visible as well. So um, that's really helpful if you can all do that. The um, Commission has been established with an objective to shape the future of adult social care in Cheshire West and Chester so that residents can be supported in achieving their aspirations for a healthy and happy life in a place they called home, playing a part in their family and community as much as they wish. And so um, that's what we're here for today. And I'd like to start by doing some introductions. So if I could um, call on people as they appear on the list on the right hand side of my screen, it's really helpful. Um, and um, the uh, the person at the top of that actually is Al is Alan Smith. Are you, are you there, Alan? Yes, I'm. It's not Alan Smith. It's Karen Smith. <laughs> All right. Okay. It's Hello, okay. Karen. We share a computer, but yes, we're here. Yes. Okay. And um, um and then um I also have Beatrix Corker from Rudd Heath. Maybe Beatrix is not with us yet. I'll come back to you. Um, I, I'll. I will, I'll start with the um, panel members. Um, Gary, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, good morning. My name is Gary Cliff and I'm Chief Executive of Cheshire West Voluntary Action that supports a number of voluntary community and faith sector organisations in Cheshire West and Chester. Thank you. Thank you. And then um, Councillor Miller. Lewis, sorry, Councillor, yeah, Councillor Miller, Keith Miller. Good morning. Um, my name is uh, Keith Miller. I'm a councillor for Neston Ward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Councillor Lewis. Uh, good morning, I'm uh, Gina Lewis. I'm a councillor for Winswood, Over and Verdin. Um, it's one of the wards within the borough which has a very large number of uh, uh, residents who need to access social care of one kind or another. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Um, Alison Lee. Good morning, Val. Good morning, all. My name's Alison Lee, and I'm here representing the National Health Service today. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Uh, Gary Cliff. I think I think we've just done mine, Val. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I don't mind saying it all again. <laughs> um, I, have we uh, got Councillor Edwards here? No, I think I think not. Um, so uh, if I could then introduce some of our officers, uh, Del Curtis. Good morning, Councillor Armstrong. Good morning, everybody. Del Curtis, Deputy Chief Exec, Cheshire Western Chester Council. Thank you, Del. Um, Morgan Jones. Good morning, my name is Morgan Jones. I'm a strategy and innovation manager here at the council. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. And Charlotte Walton. Morning, everyone. Uh, Charlotte Walton, Director for Adult Social Care and Health here at Cheshire Western Chester Council. Thank you very much. And then we have some visitors um, and I think one of them is uh, Beatrix Corker. Do you want to introduce yourself, Beatrix? No, I'm not. We, we can't hear you, Beatrix. Are you on mute? No, we still can't hear you. I wonder if someone could try and give Beatrix some help. And um, Lynn Turnbull, do you want to introduce yourself, Lynn? Good morning, Councillor Armstrong. Can you see me OK? I can, okay. yes. Um, yeah. Good morning, everyone. I'm Lynn Turnbull. I'm um, the co-chair of Cheshire Disabled People's Panel, which is a collection of uh, six organisations that are disabled people's organisations. Thank you. Thank you. And um, uh, Dale, have I? I'm afraid I've got a little bit lost on my list now because I'm not doing them in the order they appear. Would you like to introduce yourself, Dale? <laughs> Morning, everybody. I'm Dale Maskell. I'm the Chief Exec of AGK Cheshire. Thank you, Dale. <laughs> right. Now, um, we have some um, members of the public who, were the, uh, uh, who have been sent the link to the meeting if they've requested it. Um, and so I'd just like to welcome them if they are here and I hope I've not missed anybody off but uh, when we start the meeting um, uh, please introduce yourselves if I haven't uh, done so. So before we actually um, move into the um, uh, the first item for uh, people who have come to speak to us uh, we haven't had any public speakers registering uh, so we thought we could take a few minutes um, at the beginning of the meeting um, to reflect on on the last meeting um, and one of my um, hopes and plans for this meeting is that we do manage to leave some time at the end to do that reflection on what we've we've heard um, and there wasn't a lot of time for that last time. So, and we had such an interesting meeting. It's really important that we hang on to some of the things that were said. Um, just from my notes, I think there were some very powerful messages. Um, and so I'll just take a short time to, um, to, to say those. And then I'd like to ask Alison Lee um, to uh, give us a few thoughts um uh, from the meeting which because she has um circulated something to us i think um one of the 
there was a, a series of really, really strong messages given, um, and particularly from the Disabled People's Panel that came to speak um, around the poverty which affects people with disabilities um, in terms of them just um, heating their homes properly, um, putting food on the table, concerns about people getting into debt um, with the bills they receive for care. Um, strong messages about um, a need to review the minimum income guarantee that people are allowed in their financial assessments. The importance of housing in supporting people to be as independent as possible. Human rights approach, a right to live independently. Very strong message about messages about co-production, which I think we need to have some more conversations on. And also interesting presentation from about the Wigan deal, what we can learn from that in terms of relationships with our community and voluntary sector. And then we finished with a presentation from Charlotte Walton about the new ways of working, including the exciting community led support initiative, which we're going to hear uh, more about at our next meeting. So and the. Uh, the final message for me was that um, uh, can I chair it so that we leave time for discussion. So, um, Alison, would you like to chip in with your thoughts, please? Hi there, Val. Yeah, delighted to um, and thank you to the panel and, and everyone here today uh, for letting me do this. So um, I agree with many of the things you've said there, Val. I think there was a real power in the presentations that we heard and, and I certainly have, have talked um, outside of that meeting on the power of the presentation from the uh, Disabled People's Panel. Um, certainly what I took home from that is to remember how much of what we call disability is constructed around us. It's not the, the person who is well, the person is disabled because of how disabling it is to live um, the, the way that they live at the moment. And a lot of the power to change that is in our hands. Um, but it really reinforced to me the need to have people with lived experience with us on this commissioning and having leadership by and from those who are most affected by decisions is something we really need to think about how we weave that into our decision making. Um, I think I reflected that it would be really helpful, therefore, to hear from other groups who are um, users of social care. So a real lobbying sort of presentation from um, older people and indeed people with um, learning disabilities. It would be great to have that that same sort of um, strong messages coming through, through from them as well. Um, I thought uh, we were edging toward, I know our last session was really sort of setting a vision and I think we need to as a, as a commission and then as as public services really have a very clear and simple mission by what we mean by social care and what our aim is to, to improve that. And I think Val, you've almost used that in the, the first words you said this morning, it's that right to an independent life and really helping people to, to support and live um, a long and happy life. But we kind of need to nail that, I think, and have a really clear and simple vision for everybody who works within the sector and those who use it are clear that we're all um, have a sort of aligned um, common purpose, if I can say that. Um, and then absolutely to agree with you, I was also struck by the power of the presentation from Wigan. Um, and I think to have that ambition that we commission and contract with organisations who we share values with. Um, so we sort of commission with value as well as commissioning for value. Um, and that concept from Wigan about growing our own care sector from the ground up and supporting those businesses who are led by people who live and work locally uh, is really going to help us through the, the difficult times we, we have in social care and, and the, you know, the times we've got ahead in that sector. So growing our own, I really liked that, that concept from Wigan as well. Um, but it helped me to sit down and reflect on the meeting because it's such an important thing that we're doing um, that, I'm, you know, I'm trying to commit to, to do that to, after all the sessions we have. So thank you for that opportunity, Val. Thank, thank you, Alison. That's really helpful um, in making sure that we hang on to those ideas and um, messages that we received. Um, so uh, thanks for that. 
uh, one thing that we, we haven't done, uh, Morgan, is to take apologies. So could you tell us about any apologies for this morning, please? Thank you, Chair. We've had apologies from Councillor Lynn Riley and Councillor Neil Sullivan. Thank you very much, Dale. Uh, <laughs> Morgan, so, um, so uh, uh, we we can now um, progress with the meeting. As I said, uh, we haven't um, got any public speaking time, uh, no public speakers registered. Um, and um, I'd just like to remind everyone that um, the session is being recorded. And so uh, for those who are not able to come, they will be able to catch up with the meeting at a later date. But I think we're just about on time to move on to the first section, the important section where we um, want to hear about individual experiences of adult social care. And this um, we've scheduled in uh, 45 minutes for this. And Lynn Turnbull from the Disabled People's Panel and also Dale have agreed to speak on the experiences that people tell them um, about in the course of them offering their services. And also uh, so, uh, someone who uses social care has agreed to come and speak to us as well. And I very much hope that um, we can uh, offer you a welcome and also give some time for questions. So I think Lynn is first, is that right? Yeah, I think that's right, Val. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Uh, so we've got a presentation here for you. Um, some of this will just provide us background information. So I will make sure, uh, Val, that I keep to uh, the 10 minute time. Um, so just to um, reiterate, can I have the next slide, please, Morgan? Just to reiterate who is um, on the panel, just picking up one of the points earlier. So it's an alliance of um, disabled people's organisations that are governed, led, managed, staffed, volunteered and have membership that are majority led by disabled people. Um, and we use that term to cover physical impairments, mental Ill health, hearing impairments, visual impairments, learning disability or difficulty, people who would consider themselves to be neurodiverse and those with chronic illness or fatigue, to name a few, and other long term health conditions. Um, we are majority uh, pan impairment, so most of us work across all of those impairment groups. Uh, some of them are specific. So. People's Choice Group, for example, uh, represent people with learning difficulties specifically um, and deafness support networks support uh, the deaf community. Um, but that, that, that is the collection of all of us. Thanks, Morgan. Next slide, please. So uh, not, not planning on going through this, it's background. I'd, I'd covered this uh, last time in, in terms of uh, what the panel's about. So can I go to the next slide, please? So we just thought it'd be helpful just to pick up um, on the next few slides that um, we disabled people's organisations made the position clear to the UK Parliament levelling up housing and communities committee at their long term funding of adult social care oral evidence session that was given by Fazili Hadi, uh, of, uh, who's the head of policy at Disability Rights UK, the Alzheimer's Society and Age UK. Um, and that position was uh, the case for universal uncharged social care provision. Um, just got a couple of examples in, in the next three slides uh, that cover that. Uh, that position, if we could go to the next one, Morgan, is also supported by the Green Party. It's 2021 conference. And the next slide, please, Morgan. Uh, also, uh, well, Welsh Labour, uh, their cap on care charges is £100 um, at, at the moment. So, um, but they're looking to move towards a fully funded scheme. And the next slide, please, Morgan. And again, uh, the Labour uh, leader um, gave an interview with John Pring, who also confirmed uh, that he supported free social care. So um, that's just background information for you. Um, can we go to the next slide, please, Morgan? So, 
I uh, just wanted to uh, make make the point on, on this slide really that as many of you will be aware that under the provisions of the Care Act, the local authorities do have a discretionary power to charge for care. It is a political choice uh, to charge, it's not a legal requirement. Um, and the Care Act uh, signified a great shift from pre-existing duties on local authority to provide particular social care and support services to the concept of meeting needs. Um, can I go to the next slide please Morgan? So um, again, that's that's the core legal entitlement for adults to social care around meeting that need. Next slide, please. So I uh, just thought this would be helpful um, again. So the uh, so ADAS, the Association of Directors of Adult Social Care, sorry, don't use acronyms, um, have evidence that councils are failing in their statutory duties. Uh, there was a press release at the end of November where there was more than 1.5 million hours of commissioned home care that could not be provided since May 2021, which is a fivefold increase. We just thought that was um, uh, quite quite shocking statistics. So that's just a bit of information for the commission. Next slide, please, Morgan. Um, so. Um, in terms of uh, the pressures, and, and, and Val alluded to this at the beginning, in terms of the poverty, but uh, bills across all use, users have risen at least 10% over the over two years. Um, and some adults with learning disabilities are paying thousands of pounds extra a year, with six councils doubling the, the amount of money collected in charges. Can I go to the next slide, please, Morgan? So just locally, uh, not not going to labour this point because we've we 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 gave you these this information previously, um, but we know obviously how many people in in Cheshire West have been assessed as having an eligible uh, non-residential care need, otherwise known as a care and support need, which the council's got a duty to meet, and ninety percent of those with an assessed care and support need have got assets of less than 20,000. So they're often managing uh, complex and intersecting disadvantages and facing structural barriers to participation in work, leisure, wellbeing activities and public life. Next slide, please, Morgan. So um, from the uh, care and support statutory guidance, which was updated uh, earlier this year, uh, the core purpose of adult social care is to help people to achieve the outcomes that matter to them in their life, and that local authorities must promote well-being when carrying out any of their care and support functions. Thanks, Morgan. Next slide, and the one after. That's just bre a breakdown of the well-being principle. So, um, just in terms of the um, well-being uh, principle that applies to disabled adults with care and support needs and their carers. Um, we just wanted to make the point, and, and again Val alluded to it at the beginning of her, her uh, welcome uh, from the last meeting, that non-residential care charges create and intensify poverty and, and, and stress, limiting life choices and lowering health and wellbeing outcomes. In fact, 62% of people using food banks in 2020 were disabled people. Next slide, please. So um, within Cheshire West uh, and Chester's Council uh, charging policy, um, obviously you carry out a financial assessment uh, for all service users with an eligible need. And as part of that, you identify that they've got enough money to meet their housing costs, any disability related expenditure, and they can retain their minimum income guarantee in line with the Care Act guidance. Next slide, please. Thank you. So one of the key things that we've heard from, from people with lived experience is many do not have sufficient understanding of disability related expenditure. Um, the um, minimum income guarantee is wholly in inadequate at statutory and discretionary levels, uh, which we'll pick up as part of our recommendations. Um, disability related expenditure is it extra expenses created by disability or illness and can include payment for a community alarm system, higher than usual fuel bills, uh, additional cost due to special diet, purchase of equipment and anything else reasonably identified. Many people won't necessarily know what else they could identify, so it, it would be helpful, I think, to give some more options and some clearer guidance because things like insurance will generally be more expensive if you have a disability or a long term health condition. So just making sure that all disability related expenditure can be factored in. Next slide, please, Morgan. Um, so uh, 
as Val's alluded to earlier, we're very we're, we found this very difficult for this one in terms of this being such a, an emotive and sensitive subject of people being willing to come along uh, to, to talk to the commission. Um, but we will be able to submit some anonymised case studies that people are willing for us to submit and we will send those in uh, afterwards to Morgan so they can be uploaded. We have got Richard who's willing to come and talk about his lived experience of social care and the, the impact of charging uh, today. Um, so, but, but actually one of the key things that we, we know is that people on means tested benefits have to pay a significant proportion of their already small income for social care support, leaving, leaving many disabled people in poverty. Can I have the next slide, please? So um, what, what we would like to see is um, in, in the short term uh, that non-residential care charges are frozen at, at current levels for 22-23. Mm -hmm. um, that the personal expenditure, the expenses allowance for residential home uh, residences must be raised above the Bank of England predicted annual rate of infl inflation, which is predicted to be 5%. Next slide, please, Morgan. Um, this is just, a, um, I think you've already shared this as evidence, Morgan, but this is just uh, what the inflationary impact of the minimum income guarantee would, would have been if it had been increased in line with inflation. So can we go to the next slide, please? So um, we'd also um, want to look at co-producing a disability related expenditure guidance resource uh, that could be distributed from April to every person in Cheshire West and Chester with care and support needs who were charged for care and support um, and work with the local authority for that distribution. Um, and maybe also to expand that to uh, agree to a low cost procedure for submitting disability related expenditure receipts and just thinking that through. So whether a photograph, for example, of receipts would be helpful or taking a photo of a GP letter with your phone camera and emailing that through to the local authority finance uh, assessment team. Next slide, please. Uh, and that's it. So I've kept it to 10 minutes. There's uh, an another slide at the end, which is just some of the resources. So some of the stats that we've referred to, that's just got uh, another another sheet with the uh, res research resources. But I kept it to 10 minutes, Val, so exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. And uh, those slides can be put online. And so uh, thank you for, for going through them quite quickly as we uh, we do want to keep to time, but um, some uh, really clear messages there. Thank you, Lynn. And now um, Dale um, is going to do a short presentation as well before we ask Richard um, to come and give us his uh, personal experience. So Dale, thank you. Thanks, Val. Uh, Lynn set the bar now, so I need to make sure I come in at 10 minutes too. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Dale Maskell. I'm the Chief Executive of AGK Cheshire, and I'm just here to share some of the experiences of older people um, in sourcing care and then talk a bit about funding and charging for care. I thought I'd begin just to make sure that everybody was well informed, kind of outlining the, the, the scale of the demographic of older people in, in, in Cheshire. Um, just so that people are aware of how important the stakeholder older people are. So we know that in 2020, about 19% of our population was over 65, and that's going to raise um, massively up to, um, I think it was, uh, I've lost my statistics now. I'll start again. So 2020, there were 19% of people aged over 65 living in um, Cheshire, West and Chester, and 2.5% roughly were aged 85 and over. There, that's projected to rise to 28% um, over 65 and over 5.5% um, age 85 and over by 2041. So the number of people that we're talking about is increasing significantly. We also know that about a third of the households in Cheshire, Western Chester are headed up by somebody who's aged 65 and over. And again, that's expected to rise to about 42%, so a significant number of households. Um, we know that um, babies born in Cheshire, Western Chester um, are projected to live, have a life expectancy of about 80 years for men and about 83 years for women. Um, and we also know that the number of years of life expected to be spent without disability and in good health um, is uh, in Cheshire, Western Chester, that's um, 11 and a half years if you're a man and 10 
uh, nearly 11 years if you're over 65. So I'm going to move on from the numbers now because I'm making a bit of a hash of them. Apologies. I will be sharing the notes afterwards so you'll be able to have a look at that. I was just sharing some of that information because I think it's really important to know that about 25% of people aged 65 and over have a severe long-term health problem or disability, and that population is going to be growing significantly over the coming years. Um, in terms of the local picture, so um, we know um, as AGK Cheshire that about a third of the calls to us um, are for information and advice around social care at home. And we also know that people are ringing us because this population is also one that is massively digitally excluded. So they don't have the access to the information and advice or forums like this one that we might all take, take for granted. So the disadvantages in many ways. So they're also then all unable to um, source care or understand care costs um, or compare providers in the same way that you or I might take for granted as well. So when we've asked people to share their stories on this topic, like Lynn said, um, we've had a lot of problems with that in that people, because it's such an emotive topic, people um, don't feel necessarily comfortable in sharing their financial details or how they've struggled with paying for care or the emotional um, trauma that it's caused in terms of the impact it's had on them and their families when they haven't been able to source care. So like Lynn said, we'll also be um, sharing some case studies after this with people's permission. But what we do know is that when people ring us, um, the things that they're complaining about are long waits to get an assessment. They find that services are disjointed or unresponsive. Um, they find that sometimes um, social services that they expect to get involved don't want to get involved. Um, there's a fundamental lack of capacity in the system. There are some poor quality services and support. Um, support and services are being cut back and help for families providing care is being withdrawn. So there's a whole package of um, challenges there that people have to face when they're trying to fund and source care, care for their loved ones. In terms of the national picture on that, we know that um, action on social care is long overdue. Um, we don't think that the cap on um, costs and the money raised from the health and care levy um, is sufficient. And in any case, that's not going to be available to social care until 2023. Um, we don't think that we know that the demand for care is increasing, um, but we also know that the sector is not going to be able to meet that demand. We know that quality of care can be inconsistent and in some cases, and we find this, there's a rurality penalty in that you don't have any choice of care provider and or um, there is lack of any care providers in some areas. Um, we think that um, the care cap that's been proposed by the government um, will have um, the effect of the change with for people with modest assets. They'll hardly be any better off at all. And we do think it's unfair to those who have um, no assets and a modest income. And we think that it will disproportionately impact on those with low incomes and modest assets. Um, so we're disappointed in, in, in that respect. Um, and we don't think that the, the proposals address the immediate crisis of um, workforce shortages or the current unmet needs of older and disabled people. When we ask people to um, give us their experiences of um, trying to source care, some of the things that they've said, and got so these are direct quotes here. So ultimately, we were unable to resolve the huge problems we have with the total lack of respite support available to us. And this remains unresolved. Another person said, sadly, at this difficult time, we didn't have any choice in the care providers that were available. Another individual said, you can't do anything about the complete dearth of support available to carers in this country. It's truly awful. I feel so sorry for anyone without family to help them. And then finally, I haven't been able to resolve most of the issues I have, as there's no one providing the care that we need and there is no help available to us. This is the problem with the system as a whole. I feel utterly let down by the system. And specifically, just to kind of illustrate some of the challenges that people face with um, accessing care and finding the, the appropriate source of care and the people to fund it, I thought I'd share a bit of a case study that we've got. So this individual who drew on social care was in their 80s and lived with their wife. They had dementia, which was has deter which deteriorated significantly during COVID, and that's something that we're seeing quite a lot of. Um, and the lockdown kind of exacerbated that. So they were supported by some agencies at home for periods through the day, although the main support um, came from the wife, who was the primary caregiver. Um, and so 
during this year, um, one of our advisors supported them um, because they had escalating needs um, and, and a number of referrals were made. So um, we contacted the family to discuss respite care um, and we talked about COVID testing and the need for a period of isolation that might be imposed on arrival in, in that respite, respite care. And we also explained the need for consent to approach respite services um, which were available. So we, were, we did source three options for respite care. Um, but with discussions with the family, um, we talked about whether there was permission for the client to, to enter one of those care settings. Um, so there was some concern with the family about the isolation period and the impact that that would have on the individual. So we did find and source some care. However, later that week, um, that source, that place was no longer available, so they had to seek an alternative provider. Um, and we tried to source another alternative provider and they were happy to assess on the following day. Um, However, that one fell through as well, um, and they said that they weren't able um, to help that person. Another care, uh, respite care was sought. Um, the person did enter into that, that care, but then um, the care providers asked for immediate discharge because they weren't able to support the needs of that carer, and they felt that that carer needed more specific nursing care. Um, so um, then there was a, a debate around between social care and health about whether that who should fund that support and that care. And basically the, the work that we did with our advisor was navigating this system. And I think that's what's something that, that can be improved is that we are having to help people navigate incredibly complex systems. And we see so many people deciding not to engage with the system, either from a cost perspective or because of just the complexity of it. And we, we have a number of concerns. So we know for self-funders that a lot of people decline care because they don't understand the, the charges for it. We know that lots of needs will go unmet. We know that people often reduce the support um, that, that their assessed is needing to reduce the costs. We know that there's no choice in the market and there's no competition really, so there's no, no choice there in terms of costs. And we know that carers are often taking on support needs when um, Care assessed, cares have been assessed, and that there's a risk of carer breakdown there. So, I think just to, to reiterate, I think that we would support all of the the recommendations and the and the uh, the case that Lynn put forward, um, as we have um, kind of common cause here, because older as Lynn said in the last uh, commission hearing, older people are often the disabled people that um, that Lynn's organisations support as well. Thank you. Thanks, um, Dale. Uh, I think there are some individual situations there that um, could be taken up with um, uh, with maybe um, uh, Charlotte Walton, uh, but I think also there are some general um, comments that you've made about the the impact of uh, the difficulties in negotiating the system and uh, the fact that um, the cost, the charging system puts people off accessing care and the impact then on family and um, paid carers. So, um, but thank you very much for um, telling us about what you pick up in your role, helping people negotiate the system. Um, and I would like to move straight on um, to Richard. Um, if Richard, uh, if you are uh, ready uh, to speak to the Commission about your personal experience, I can't see your camera um, switched I'm, on. I'm here. You're there. Well, um, Richard, thank you very much indeed for agreeing to speak to us. Uh, are you able to put a camera on? If not, we we can hear you. Yeah, I prefer to be heard today because I'm a bit chesty and um, uh, I'm OK. That's that's fine. So would you would you like to go ahead and um, tell us about your experience of accessing so adult social care? Yeah. Well, I've been very I've been very fortunate over the last um, uh, 12 years I've been living. I've been living independently uh, for the last 12 years and 
I um, have my own team um, that support me. I had cerebral palsy all my life, so I'm no, no different. I also have underlying conditions. Um, I, ha- I had to have a kidney removed in 2011. I nearly died twice of sepsis. Um, so that's a bit of background for you of where <laughs> where I come in the system. My my package is quite a big full package. It's 98 hours a week, 24-7. Um, so I'm basically the um the problem in my experience is that um when we first uh, started this package back in in uh, 2000 and uh <clears throat> nine all that time ago um i i um my I think my first original, um, my first original co- contribution was around eighty nine ten a week, and the it is now at an eye watering one hundred and. 1395. Now, how somebody living on benefits can support themselves without uh, financial help from family? <clears throat> Luckily, I have that. Unfortunately, my father has had to um, give, uh, give me financial support um, with uh, a standing order. I won't go into how much it is, but Lynn, how, Lynn knows how much it is. And it's quite a bit of money every month. But <coughs> fortunately, he, he can afford it. But I'm not the only one. There, there are millions of people like me having to do the same things. And unfortunately, this has been this has been my bugbear for a while. In this day and age, it is totally, totally wrong, and it's abhorrent to me for somebody. I take myself as example, but. There are, there will be people far off worse than me, health wise as well, that are are able to, um, you know, not able to support themselves. Like a couple of simple things. When, when, when this all started, I I could do everything I wanted to. One of my things is going to gigs. I love it. I love my music. I love my uh, entertainment. If uh, if I wasn't in a wheelchair and uh, to be, you know, 
uh, if I wasn't uh, physically disabled, I, you know, I'd probably be working in some radio station broadcasting. That was my ideal career for me. Unfortunately, because of the regs and rules, if you're physically disabled, severely disabled even, and you have to be on benefits, that's what you have to do. So, and you have other medical conditions in in two thousand and um in two thousand and ten um my i made one last trip to a place that doesn't exist anymore skylarks it wasn't cheap but again we could fund it i could not i could i cannot fund my own holidays getting insurance is a problem because of my medical conditions and to be honest with you, I'm a bit scared to travel abroad. One of my main goals would be to get, go to the US because I have family there. But I would have I, 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 I would have to go by a big ship on a cruise. And uh, they will laugh, but it here's here's the thing. Um, gloves and the also on the medical side, gloves and you know the PPA and masks and other things that we have to buy we even have to buy our uh, our own uh printing paper was seen as a was it, direct payments is seen as a micro business well okay a micro business is all very well, but we have to have the right support in so that we can do things and uh, the writing and also the right encouragement to do it as well. Some 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 people are. I'm not confident to go it alone. Some people don't have the support that they need. And it's it's quite unbelievable in 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 this day and age. As my as my father said uh when we got the letter, the original amount of money that was quoted at me was a hundred and thirty five a week that is every week that's my contrib that was my original contribution now I'm currently paying a hundred and nearly a hundred and fifteen quid a week but I'm getting by, but in this day and age, it is not right for the likes of me and the likes of 
other people to be going through this. It is not on in polite society. If the public knew what was really going, if the public knew what was really going on, I noticed over the last uh, couple of weeks that the BBC have shone light on this. They did their own investigation, and it was I didn't see it. But it was really interesting that people are starting to realise about this contribution. And people are people are realizing unfortunately it is law in this country. How it became law, I just do not. No. As my dad said, and I personally agree, it's unsustainable in this current climate. And surely to God, we have to do something about the, the most severe, the most severe and our, our vulnerable people in this country. There are people that are more vulnerable than me and that have, that don't have a voice like me. I speak on behalf of them. Thank you for listening. Richard, thank you very much for talking to us and telling us your story, which is very powerful. And I've made a note of one of the things you said that you're getting by, but in this day and age, it's not right just to get by. And I think that um, was you know, a really um, vital play way that you um, brought to an end all the things you've had to say to us. And I uh, really w appreciate you coming to speak to us this morning. And we have now got a little bit of time to ask questions of yourself initially um, and um, uh, Dale and Lynn, but particularly of yourself. Um, and I uh, would like to just open it up and see if there is, um, if there are any questions or comments from the panel. Um, <coughs> have we got anything? that we'd like to ask um, Richard. Uh, I've got Gary and uh, then Lynn. Yes, thank you very much. Um, yes, Richard, I was just, D Dale's given us a link to an article that's talking about um, what asset-based community is all about and, and strengths-based uh, things, which I've, I've just had a little quick look at. And it asks a question at the very end, and, it's, it's, and it says, the article says it's as simple as this. And I wonder what your, your answer to this would be. What does a good life look like for you and your family, and how can we work together to achieve it? I think the goal, the goal for me always has always been to live as much of an independent life as I can. Since Skylark's closed, although because I because I moved uh, independently, uh, I made my last trip there months before it closed in Nottingham, and um, it was kind of my second home because I had both. I had like two people that I'm very close to. I'm still in touch with one of them um, now. Um, two members of staff that really helped me at a very important time. Uh, so, um, but my, you talk about the family side, um, um, it's, I mean, 
when my mum was with us, she, the, the phrase we used at a funeral, she used uh, moved mountains for me and made me do whatever I wanted to. So I think what 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 I think we we really need need to look at is speaking to our 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 our, our friends in power and really upping the benefits quite substantially because this one one percent rise is not enough it's not it's it it is the charge in itself but i wish you see to give you an idea my charge started at 89.10. That was reasonable for what my income was at the time. But it's gone up extra, extra, uh, exponentially. And it, it's quite incredible. So can I ask a, a further, just a follow up question then, Richard, in terms of, yeah, you've, yeah. you've said it's interesting that you said your, your mum was involved in moving mountains for you. Um, I must admit, in my experience, that's often the case, isn't it? That family members, especially parents, especially in the early years, have, have, have got to move mountains. And sometimes it feels like they've, they're shifting mountains because it's a it's a difficult well, job to get, to get the right support. You know, I, I basically, basically, I've been very lucky. I, I'm. I'm here today to speak on behalf of others that can't speak. And, and, that, and how do you... that's the way that's the way I've always seen my my role within. You know, I was a board member for the disability positive for ten years. <laughs> I was literally. As little time, yeah, we joke about it now. We to this day, I was hired in a taxi on the way to Parliament. You know, so great. Uh, you're, you're doing a great job. To stand up for us. So thank you, Richard. Yeah. Thanks, um, Gary. R Richard, you're obviously um, speaking. Um, very powerfully on behalf of everyone um, with disabilities. Yeah. Um, how do you think we, uh, the um, organisations, <coughs> Health Service Council, other other organisations in our partnership, uh, could support you to do that? Is there... well, you know what I was I was thinking about this. I think. What what really needs to happen? I mean, I mean this this horrible virus has got in the way of everything at the moment, and I think I was thinking if we get to a time where that's under control, I think there needs to be. Some, I was thinking about, I've been thinking about this for a long time. I think there needs to be a well-known face. I, I, I don't know who it is. I, I, I don't kind of know who it is, but I, I, I think there needs to be someone or, or maybe a couple, maybe a couple of people that come in as a PA 
and see what it's like to work as a PA and to be, to basically get get talking about the 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 whole thing it needs to be talked about it ne- Pe- people need to understand what what this is a, what this is about you know it's it's crazy you know a lot of people I'll be found this um, with a situation which again I won't go into um, when I was on the board um, I had a conversation with, with somebody I I actually said to them it sounds like they don't know what uh, what PAs do you know what the job is, <laughs> you know, that that's another problem. Thank, thank you, Richard. That's um, certainly a suggestion that and um, important that people really know and understand um, what the jobs we're talking about involve. Uh, Lynn, do you want to come in? Yeah, I thought about that it'd just be helpful to pick up a little bit on on Gary's point, but just reflecting on listening to what you said, Rich, and maybe the bit about the PA thing could be something that's factored in Val for the workforce discussion around the commission, maybe, so that's not a forgotten workforce. Um, But Rich, just after listening to you, um, in, in terms of what a good life looks like for you, do you feel with what you pay or with the income that you've got available? Because uh, it sounds like you'd spend your life going to gigs and, and the theatre and, and various I, things. That's yeah. what you love doing. Can, could you afford to do that without the support from your dad? Not really. I was going to I was going to illustrate this. Oh, you know, you've known me a long time, right? <laughs> and you also know I'm a I'm a closet Fleetwood Mac fan. Right? Someone's got I, to be Richard. I, I have been for years since I was the height of a grasshopper. Right? Lindsay Buckingham is doing one gig in England next year. The one gig is at my favourite place. And I bought I didn't book tickets because of the cost to me. I'm thinking about it all the time, Lynn, as you know. Because you said you said you have to check your bank statement every couple of days to make sure you've got enough money to make, make, make ends meet, Richard. <coughs> <coughs> I have to check everything. Yeah. I have to check everything that, everything that goes out in as well. Thanks, Richard. Appreciate that. Thanks, Lynn, for asking that question and Richard's response, which um, really clarifies the um, uh, the impact of being able to lead a good life, a life that you choose, which might not be going to gigs for everybody, um, but for Richard, Richard, for you, it is, that's what you want to do and that's what um, makes your life interesting and and rewarding for you. So um, I, I think that, you know, it, Richard's, able to come and talk to us about his story really brings to life um, what Lynn, particularly in her presentation, um, gave us and also Dale. So are there, um, we've just got a couple of minutes um, left. Are there any um, questions, further questions? Um, 
Uh, Councillor Lewis. Thank you, uh, Val. Um, I was just wondering, um, I know Richard can't perhaps get to some of the bigger gigs that he would like to, but here in Winsford, we do to, uh, have two venues where there is some really good music uh, happening. Um, I'm not quite sure where Richard lives um, or whether he would have uh, somebody who could uh, transport him. But um, if he'd like to send me an email, I can send him some details of some of the things that are going on in two of the venues that we have here in, um, uh, in Winsford, both of which are wheelchair accessible um, and uh, certainly would uh, be easy for him to get in and out of. That would be helpful. Mm. Thank you very much, uh, Gina. Thank you. Right. And um, Keith uh, Miller, I think this um, might have to be the last question, but Keith. Um, thank you very much, uh, Lynn, Dale and Richard. And Richard, uh, very thought provoking. And I, I go straight to the uh, Care Act, you know, where you're not able to live your life the way you'd like to. And you're having to be supported by your, your dad to survive. And one of the nine areas of the Care Act is the uh, health and social and e economic well-being. And yeah. it, it's really thought for, thought provoking for me. So th th thank you very much for sharing that. And it's your presentation will definitely uh, stick in my mind for a long time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Keith. And um, I, at this point, uh, we do um, have um, to move on to the next item on the agenda, but I think we will be continuing our conversations, certainly with the Disabled People Panel and with Dale, to look at um, how they uh, can contribute in whatever way is the best way um, to future meetings. Uh, because of their uh, contact with people who use and draw on social care. But particularly like to thank Richard for coming along and really setting the scene uh, for um, further discussions. So thank you very much indeed. And I would like to move on now and welcome John Jackson, who I see has just popped up on my screen. Green. Uh, welcome, John. Um, I gather that you're the Local Government Association National Care and Health Improvement Advisor for Finance and Risk. Um, and as we know, finances are very important and very topical at the moment. Um, so uh, moving on from a very individual story about what it's like um, when for someone drawing on social care, this is um, a, a more national perspective, but uh, nonetheless very important. So uh, can I hand over to you, John? Uh, thank you very much. Um, just to say as further instruction to myself, my background is I'm a SIP for Qualified Accountant. I worked joined local government from university in 1979. I spent 27 years in financial roles and corporate financial roles, including being director of resources in Oxfordshire County Council. And then I moved across to be the director of adult social services and did that for 10 years. So I've got the experience of being both a council chief finance officer and a director of adult social services. For the last five years, I've been working um, within uh, the Care and Health Improvement Programme, which sits within the Local Government Association, but is also overseen by um, the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services, ADAS. Um, uh, and, and my work is working with individual councils. Um, um, it's also about working with national government. So I spend a lot of time discussing uh, financial issues uh, to do with adult social care, including trying to make the case for more resources for adult social care. Um, if I can move on, if we could ask to move on to the next slide, please. And um, what I was going to do is, is I don't know exactly what you've heard in previous meetings. By the way, I have been listening to the sessions from the start, so I have heard those three very powerful contributions you've just had. 
Um, um, uh, so, but I thought I might make some very basic comments about adult social care, which I'll go through very quickly, just to make sure that you know those, although I suspect you probably do already. And then secondly, I was asked to say a little bit about um, uh, Cheshire West and Chester's um, uh, position in relation to adult social care. And earlier this year, I did uh, talk um, Del Curtis and um, um, uh, Charlotte Walton through um, the um, results for 2019-20 for looking at the use of resources in adult social care. So I'm going to share some of that with you um, as well. Uh, and then what I want to do is look nationally at some of the pressures facing adult social care um, and some possible opportunities for you to look at in trying to respond to financial pressures. But I, I must stress the opportunities will not make the financial pressures disappear. So I can move on to the next slide, please. Um, so um, these are some basics and, and, and I'm I, I suspect as an audience you understand all of this, but actually my experience of coming into adult social care from outside is that actually most people outside adult social care don't understand a lot of the basics. Um, that adult social care is about personal care, it's not the same as health care, although there is some big issues about the overlap and the seamless, or the, ideally the seamless working with health care. Uh, and, and, and it's about what's called activities of daily living. Um, it's helping people getting dressed, washed, going to the toilet, eating and providing psychological support. Um, people often think, well, and often people look at a council budget and say it's not spent on very many people. I think the key point is if you live long enough, you're almost going to need some sort of support and care at some point in time. And in practice, as people age, um, they find that their ability to do things start, starts to get le as less good as it, it is. Um, um, so, and in practice, most people get that help, not from the state, whether that's a health service or uh, or local authorities, but actually from family or friends or privately. Um, and um, it's also important because often the focus in the public is often about care homes for older people. In practice, most people are supported in their own homes and not care homes. And I think most of us would think that that is a good position where people are supported in their own homes and can continue to live there. Um, there are eligibility criteria uh, which are set out in, in, in the Care Act 2014, and they are quite restrictive. Let's be clear about this. Low levels of need mean that people will not meet the eligibility criteria, um, uh, and that may be something you might want to ask me about. Um, uh, but that does reflect a national position in national legislation. Um, as as you've heard, there are issues about people's contribution to pay paying for care, and that's true um, or, almost for everybody. Uh, um, um, nearly everybody pays something towards their care. And the final part, a lot of the debate is often about older people not being today. Um, um, you've had a big focus on younger adults with disabilities, which is great because actually we, local authorities spend more money on younger adults with disabilities than they do with older people now. OK, so I, I said I'd done some work on use of resources in adult social care. And if the next slide could go up. This is some background information. We, we developed this tool um, in 2018 um, and we've got results for the year uh, years 2017-18 onwards. This is public data published by NHS Digital who are responsible for collecting uh, finance and activity data uh, uh, about adult social care. Um, and um, we we think the, 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 the tool has had real benefits for local authorities. There has been other people have done work on it in the past. Uh, we sometimes they charge people to, to make use of. Um, but there is a danger that there's lots of data around. The real question is what is reliable data? Um, and there's no point making comparisons on unreliable data because often it's misleading and it avoids the issues you really do need to look at. Um, so 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 that's what we try to do. And um, when I'm I'm I've been very keen to stress that if you look at comparisons, it's not about making a judgment about an authority. It's actually about saying there's some areas for further investigation. So I'm hoping that this section will give you some thoughts about some areas you might like to uh, ask the local authority to look at, uh, possibly as part of your recommendations. Um, we normally um, give um, um, give do 
do discussions within regions. So obviously Cheshire West and Chester the Northwest region, but I also offer uh, to talk local authorities through their results. And that's what I offered to Dell and to Charlotte, um, which and that took place um, in March this year. Uh, and about 60 authorities out of the 150 responsible for adult social care in England have taken that offer up. Um, this analysis today focuses on 1920, and you're probably saying, why? 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 Why is it so far back? There is some really big issues with 2021, which very much reflects the impact COVID's had, the differential approach that's been taken to COVID in different areas, the different ways that's been funded, uh, and the different ways that local authorities have, uh, have reported it. So I, I don't, I wouldn't want to give you any comments about the 2021, because I, I, as I said earlier on, there's a danger if you use unreliable information, I'll give you misleading information. I think the 1920 information does have some, raises some questions for you to consider further. The headline message is you, in terms of if you compare spending on adult social care with the adult population in your local authority, is you spend exactly at the average. However, that overall figure is not particularly helpful because the two main um, um, links to spending on adult social care are uh, firstly, um, older people. If you have a lot of older people, you tend to spend more and you do. On the other side, though, deprivation, deprived authorities spend tend to spend a lot more as well. And the reason for that is health needs are, uh, are higher, which means disabilities tend to be higher. Uh, particularly in within older people um, uh, and and it, and you actually have fewer people you will end up in, in a, a deprived area you'll end up have, looking after a greater proportion of the population who have needs because in some areas you would see those people making their own arrangements and they're not included within the figures so the fact you're the average probably is not particularly interesting what's more interesting is what happens in the age groups and I've got more detail on that overall uh, what I would say is what was interesting in 1920 is your overall spending increased to over 10 percent. So this is before COVID, remember, uh, which is significantly higher than that, uh, the increase for England, which was just over 4 percent. Move on to the next slide. Um, this focuses on your spending in younger adults. And sorry, you've gone through two there. If you go back, please. OK, so your overall spending in younger adults is quite high, and I think this is something it would be worth you trying to understand better. And this will be a message I gave to Dell and to um, Charlotte early in the year. Um, um, we, we, there isn't really a pattern. You might think, well, is spending on younger adults going to be high in more deprived areas? Well, actually, there's no evidence that's the case. Um, there are some very deprived authorities who are very low spenders here, and there are some very prosperous areas that are high uh, spenders as well. So there isn't a direct link. We think that it may reflect what's available for people locally if, if it, uh, and what then the advice that is given to them in terms of the choices. Um, there are some areas which will be very prone to use care homes to support um, younger adults, uh, particularly in the past. Um, they tend to be more expensive. There is a big question whether those that approach provides the right uh, opportunities for independence and to maximise the outcomes that you you heard from earlier on uh, in those circumstances. Um, and I think there are some big questions of that, and we have provided some advice which is available nationally uh, and um, and 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 Dale and Charlotte are aware of about uh, particularly in terms of supporting people with learning disabilities which I think could potentially have uh, implication for other groups. Uh, but overall, I think there's a question about how much you spend in this area. Um, your spending on, on your adults also increased a lot compared to 1819, but that's typical of what's happened generally, and I suspect reflects some budget decisions you took in um, um, February, stroke March 2018. Uh, so 2019. Um, higher, the level of spending, though, reflects two things. How many people do you support? And also, how much do you spend on each long term care package? Um, and the next slide, please. Um, does give you some details about so you slight support slightly higher number of uh, younger adults than elsewhere, uh, um, 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 which will be one of the factors. But the main issue is, is that you are you spend quite a high amount on 
on on each care package and and i think the question i i i i've already put to dell and, and to charlotte is is do you know why that's the case and these are some factors which you could con uh, which 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 are might be the cause of that um what is i've already mentioned is about the use of care homes which generally are more expensive uh, people are not supported efficiently. Now, you might wonder what does that mean? But in many practice, if, for example, you have a very small supported housing scheme supporting, say, a couple of people rather than six, generally that will cost more to support the person in those settings. And there's also a big question about whether people are using assistive technology to its full potential. It can involve um, a significant amount of one-to-one -one and two-to-one cares. Now, I'm not saying that's not important in some circumstances, but there is quite a lot of variability on that, um, and I think that's an area potentially that could be reviewed, obviously in conjunction with individuals and their families. There may be local factors affecting the cost of care, and in particular in more rural areas, there is some evidence of the care costs are high. You heard earlier on about the lack of choice. Part of the lack of choice also tends to, I think, affect the cost of care uh, in those areas, and that's broadly a reflection of the, the lack of um, of, 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 of care workers, I think, in those areas is probably the most important issue. Uh, but sometimes the care packages can be because people are, are, are very risk averse, and I'm talking about people like social workers and so forth, and also sometimes colleagues in the health service. And there's a lack of um, encouraging people to live independently. If we move on to the next slide, this then looks at the spending on old people. On old people, you're relatively high spend on younger adults. I'm saying that's a, 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 something you, you you ought to look at in more detail. Um, in the cases you're spending for on older people is actually quite low. Um, <clears throat> and I have you're not particularly deprived of authority. Now, what I would say is that I am absolutely confident you've got some significant pockets of uh, deprivation in some small areas. But but we're trying to come look at a local authority overall against other local authorities. And overall, you are below the average for deprive, uh, deprivation if you look at local authorities in England. Um, and um, I think this is partly reflected in your spending here, which is you're seeing a relatively um, low levels of spending. However, the, the odd thing is that actually the numbers you support as a proportion of the person's population is only just below the national average, which I would have said is a bit surprising given your relative position in terms of um, um, levels of de deprivation. The reason why you're very low spend is you actually spend a very small amount on, 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 on older people's long term care. Now, that could look like the council's being really mean. I don't think that's necessarily the conclusion anybody should draw from that. Um, uh, I think our view would be if you can identify, if you can have an early conversation with people, you've got the right approach to assessing people's needs, you're providing good quality information and advice, there is scope to support people in a less expensive way by the targeted support, which really addresses the things that people struggle to do for themselves. Um, so I think that's possibly pro positive, but you need to check that out. Uh, you know, that might be quite a big issue because there may be danger. A, you're getting care very cheaply and it won't, it won't carry on in the future. And that will be a point I'll come back to on the, on, 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 on the next part of the presentation. Um, so I think, again, there's some issues there. So if we move on to the, 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 the this is the final slide on, on this area. So these are some, just a summary, I think, of the areas of if ever uh, investigation. Uh, you're relatively high spend on younger adults. Do you understand why? Um, I think there is an issue about the numbers of older people uh, with long care, term care that you support. Question why? But it may be some really interesting, good things are going on there. Um, that may give you some opportunities to make some savings. Um, what I would say is any savings is not about taking money out of the adult social care budget. It's actually about moderating the increased need to spend on adult social care. Um, and, 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 and whatever you want to do, you, some of these changes will take a long time uh, to, to, to implement, which is why I would always encourage local authorities to have at least a three year plan for adult social care. There is an argument for it being much longer than that. If we can move on um, to the next slide. So that's the end of that session on looking at your position in Cheshire uh, West and Chester. I just now want to talk about um, 
my my perspective on, on what are the current financial pressures facing out of social care and can i say these are things that are happening they're not necessarily um they don't take into account some of the policy issues that was being raised with you earlier on so um i think uh, i think it's important you understand if you want to respond to those other issues there'll almost certainly be a financial implication and they will be on top of what i'm going to describe here first one is about inflation inflation has for the last five years or so has become the biggest annual financial pressure on adult social care it's more significant than um, 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 demography which i will come on to shortly um, and it's been very much driven by the fact that um, in 2015 the then government introduced um, the national living wage on top of the minimum wage and that's led to some quite significant increases in um, the, the cost of employing people who are relatively poorly paid. Um, uh, I think the fact those wages have gone up, I think most of us would say is good. Um, however, the fact is adult social care is a sector which is very much dependent on people who are paid at or just above the national living wage. Um, and so there's then a question about, well, what what what's going to happen next year and we've got some facts already the government's announced the national living wage is going to go up by 6.6 percent from the 1st of april um 2022 uh, indeed it made an announcement on friday which implied that possibly that those 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 wages should go up before then and it has provided some funding for that uh, which will only cover the cost this year um so if you take that then it's not that doesn't mean the fees to providers will have to go up by a straight 6.6 percent because roughly and this is roughly it's, it's it will vary depending on individual providers and individual circumstances but roughly about 70 percent of their cost base is driven by the national living wage increase if you apply a general inflation rate of two and a half percent which i would acknowledge is actually low and you apply that to the rest that gives a, an overall composite inflation rate for providers about five Point, just under 5.4 percent but the other issues around is the government has announced there's going to be a health and social care levy that will be paid by uh, all um, employers ne from next april um, local authorities are, are due to get compensation for that through as part of the local government financial settlement but that doesn't cover the position of private sector and independent providers of um, adult social care and our best estimate at the moment that's probably another half a percent on top of that so 5.3 set per seven plus 5.5 percent comes to nearly 5.9 percent um and in the next slide i will explain a little bit about why um, it's more likely to be above six percent i mean the first thing is i've already acknowledged general inflation is likely to be more than two and a half percent um, the relevant rate in the latest inflation rate was 4.2 percent in October 2021 and that partly reflects increasing energy costs which is obviously an important issue if you run a care home for example um, if, if general inflation was 3.5 percent that would increase inflation pressures by 0.3 percent so would take it over six percent on their own but beyond that many providers are telling us we're having to put wages up by more than 6.6 percent because there is a lot of competition for um for for low paid workers from other sectors such as retail or hospitality um uh, uh, and and so forth and all of that ignores the fact there's a huge workforce issue which i'll be very surprised it hasn't come up as evidence to your commission already um a really really big issue about uh, both vacancies within social care but also the turnover of social care and and i think potentially that may put pressure on providers to increase wages well beyond the 6.6 percent um, and obviously that has to be paid for somehow and now moving on to the in the next slide we move on to uh, demographic pressures um the association directors of adult social services adas um, they do an annual survey um, of um, financial issues to do with adult social care. Um, that's been going for more than 10 years now. Uh, and there was a consistent trend for most of the last decade where demographic pressures were about 3% of the net spending on adult social care. 
Uh, and increasingly, that was more about younger adults than about older people. Uh, and we can discuss that if you if you want to come back to that on questions. In the last couple of years, the, the their survey has shown those pressures are getting bigger and bigger, and a particular increase in in uh, for 20, uh, um, 21, 22, where directors estimate that the demographic pressures are about 660 million pounds, which is now 4.1% of the net adult social care budget. And I think my view would be that it would be imprudent to assume a lower figure than that. And, and, and Dell and Charlotte and their people will have worked out a figure for you, which is included in your budget. Uh, and I think you need to listen to their advice about what the pressures will be for next year. We move on to the next page. The, the, the difficult, I mean, I, I'm sorry this is rather bleak, but I'm afraid the financial pressures facing adult social care are really, really difficult at the moment. They're probably the most difficult I can recall in the 15 years I've been working in adult social care. Um, there are a lot of other pressures around. I mean, there's a long term impact of COVID on the need for long term care. That's complicated, but almost certainly will add to pressures. There's a big issue about the pressures in formal carers, which undoubtedly has got worse under COVID. Um, and, and you've heard some of that, I think, already today. Um, there is an issue about unmet need, undermet need, wrongly met need. Uh, and some of that is about whether the eligibility criteria are too strict or not. But it's also about some people won't come forward, even if they do meet the eligibility criteria. There's issues about the Mental Health Act and about mental health issues, which again, I think COVID's had, um, I think everybody's saying is COVID's had an adverse impact on. There's something called liberty protection safeguards, which will replace the deprivation liberty safeguards um, coming in and what will be the financial impact of that. And there's a Norfolk case on charging um, disabled people, um, which is around, which will have an impact uh, potentially and uh, does relate to some of the points that were being made earlier on but there is a cost associated with with, with 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 responding to that i can't give you any national information on any of them but they're all factors i think you need to be trying to work out um, what the impact for you might be if i then move on to the next slide um the the the, the there are known pressures which are we can't quantify at this point in time, and they broadly relate to the government's adult social care reform agenda. And there's four elements, actually. There's one I'm missing off the bottom um, bullet point. Uh, there is paying for care where with the, the cap and what the financial consequences of that will be. There's something called the fair rate for care, which is linked into that, which is the government saying local authorities should be paying a fair rate for care. Um, there's new assurance arrangements where, where effectively the Care Quality Commission will be assessing what each local authority is doing and what the financial consequence of that. And then, of course, there's last week's adult social care white paper, which does include some money. Um, uh, but I think most people would say it's a, 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 a the, 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 the ideas are good, but they probably need to go much further in terms of what needs to happen. And we might come back to that with some of my final slides. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, please. Um, what's the overall position? Well, there was some good news for local government and spending review. There was some extra grant for local government of 1.6 billion and local government can increase the council tax. The government's made it clear to that and there's likely to be some growth in council tax income. In total, that might be worth another 1.4 billion. But the challenges facing local government is you've got everything I've been describing in adult social care, but then you've got pressures in children's care, social care, but also other services. So really, really big issues around. Uh, for the government's announcement focused on the extra resources next year, but there's no extra resources promised for 23, 24 and 24, 25, other than through council tax increases. Um, and financial pressures in adult social care in each of those years will be an extra billion pounds, and that's every year. So in 23 24 it's going to be at least a billion pounds inflation and demography together um for on top of what i've already said for for that year and then another one billion pounds on top of that for 24 25 um so it's quite bleak this week we are expecting the local government finance settlement uh, with some people like thinking it might might be announced on on, on wednesday but we wait to see um and if I just move on to the concluding slides, um, um, I think there's some areas you need to think about. And I think I hope all these areas have the possibility 
to reduce spending, but also at the same time actually improve outcomes for people. You might think, well, that's impossible. But actually, the right intervention, I think, can lead to um, people being able to live more ordinary lives, more independent lives. And the consequences of that are it's better for them in terms because that's what they want. And I think you've heard quite a lot of that today. But also, if it's done in the right way, it actually leads to lower spending on long term care for people. Right. Um, first point is you really need good quality information and advice. It needs to be accessible. And that some of that those points have been made today as well. Um, and, and that so that people can access what support there is within the community. Reablement, I'm presuming you've had some explanation on reablement already, but reablement is about when something happens to somebody, it's about creating the confidence and the skills for them to start doing things for themselves. A lot of evidence if people have a really serious health incident, not only do they need physiotherapy and, 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 and to, 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 to help with getting to recover, rehabilitation, uh, but also they need help with understanding how to look after themselves again. And that's quite common, particularly in older people. Um, and, 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 and the fact is reablement is some a service which is available quite widely, but needs to be expanding much more widely. So it's the default option for everyone presenting with care need. A lot of evidence, right and effective reablement at the right time significantly reduces the need for people to have permanent care going forward. And in other cases, it reduces the amount of care they might need. I've already talked a bit about assistive technology, but there's no doubt I think that's an area to look at. And there is the issue of housing, um, which I believe was one of the things that was mentioned last time round, uh, uh, based on the, on, on the chair's introductory comments. And then some just so, in terms of seizing those opportunities, as an authority, we move on to the final slide. Um, Hello, thank you. Um, the um, the those things are not straightforward. You can't just simply say to Dell and Charlotte, do it. But you know, there's like to be money and time needs to be invested in this. And how can that be done? Um, I think it, this does point to if you want to take a really radical approach towards adult social care, this isn't just something for adult social care. Um, or people close to them. It's actually for the council as a whole. It needs a corporate approach involving both members and officers. It's, n it's be an issue beyond both DASIs and chief finance officers because you'll need input from your housing people, your planners, your IT experts. And I think there's also a big question about how do you work with the with the NHS? Um, I, I mean, I think a lot of us are disappointed so little of the health and social care levies going into um, social care next year or indeed really for the next three years but actually there is a conversation I think you need to have with your NHS locally is in terms of addressing the pressures that undoubtedly are on the NHS this this winter but also in the future in terms of the backlog there is a really big issue about what adult social care needs to do to do that and that's the end of my presentation John, thank you very much indeed for that um, wide ranging look. Um, and I, I'm really glad that you were able to focus it down to, to Cheshire West, some of it, um, as well as that overall umbrella look at what's happening with the white paper and national um, changes. And um, obviously, um, you've already had some discussions with uh, Del Curtis and Charlotte Walton, our um, director of People and uh, Director of Adult Social Care. So um, that's great. And I know that some of those conversations um, are happening, but it, it yes. will be good to share some of that as well with the Commission. Um, I was particularly pleased when, although you did mention savings, you did um, then link that to investing in, in social care in other ways to help people be um, as independent as as possible and and live uh, the good life that we were talking yes. about in the in the previous session. So um, yes, um, we need to um, make sure that it isn't it isn't about saving money. Whatever we do is about delivering more effectively what people uh, what people want. 
Um, so, um, and also a really uh, good um, link into the integration agenda and what we can uh, uh, what we can do with our health partners in bringing things together. And I can see lots of hands going up with questions for you. Um, so um, first of all, um, uh, Councillor Miller and then Gary Cliff are um, re re representative from the voluntary sector. So uh, Keith. Thank you, Chair. Hi, John. Thank you very much for a very informative presentation. One thing that I did pick up on was uh, you mentioned the CQC report and the new strategy, which is going to be place based. And the overall theme is how we provide care in the local system. So that would be to me, all partners, what is the outcome? But then if we look at some of the constraints that we have, uh, looking at the uh, the social care grant allocations from central government. Uh, if we look, I've, I've got the figures, uh, but if we look at it ahead of population, Cheshire and Merseyside is £36.51 pence per head of population. But the combined uh, Cheshire West and Cheshire East, that is £21.50 pence per head of population. We then look at uh, review of the NHS continued healthcare and NHS funding. Uh, I've, I've looked at data from 2019, 2020, Q4, and CWAC C, C footprint event identifies a lower trend on NHS continued health funding, which covers health and social care, but a higher trend in NHS. Uh, funding nursing care, which is a single band rated at 87. And I think that can be broke down into the different funding allocations to CCGs. Uh, so I, I think it, it is the overall picture of the funding allocations. We know with the CCGs that is evidence based, but I don't think the, the health care, uh, the social care funding allocation is, is based uh, so, so you say for for under for young people, uh, the national is uh, 0.86 percent, and uh, we're we're slightly higher at 0.93 percent, and we're lower on uh, significantly lower. Or we, sorry, we've got a uh, we're about average on older people, but we spend significantly less. So uh, yeah, you know, I can see trends there. But how do we get the, the correct support to deliver the care provided in the local system with the constraints that we have nationally? I think you're asking a question primarily about is there fair funding to use an authority compared to other authorities? Uh, I mean, I, I think I'd say um, three things I think about that. The first thing is that um, the current way adult social care resources are um, distributed is something called the relative needs formula, which has been around for quite a long time. And broadly, it distributes money on the basis of how your population profile. So you get more if you've got older, more old people and together with your level of deprivation. So the fact you've got more older people that has an impact on 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 the way the formula works, but it's also um, affected by the fact you're less deprived than the average local authority. That the second point I want to make is that formula is going to be reviewed as part of paying for care, and discussions are just starting on that. And I think you will there'll be some proposals around next summer. However, the most important point I want to make is actually <clears throat> nowadays nearly all spending by a local authority on adult social care is paid for, is raised locally, right? It's very little that actually comes in. The qu figures you're quoting were specific grants that came out from COVID, which the government wanted to get out to local authorities and wanted a basis for doing so. Um, but in practice, you know, if you look at um, 
and this is true even for the poorest authorities, you will find that the majority of the funding for adult social care comes from the council tax and from the business rates. There's very little government grant funding nowadays. And in fact, the last year, 18 months, has been a real exception now because obviously we have had specific grant funding which has helped with adult social care. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Can I uh, bring in Keith? Uh, and then Richard wanted to ask a question. Uh, sorry, I meant Gary. <laughs> and then Richard. <laughs> thanks, Gary. Yes, th thanks, Val. And yeah, th thanks, John. Yeah, really interesting stuff. I uh, just want to sort of make, a, make an observation and then perhaps ask a question. Um, and as you'd expect, I'm representing the uh, voluntary community and third sector. So I was interested in what you're saying about we need to moderate the increased need. Um, I think you'd probably agree that the uh, the voluntary community and faith sector have got a role to play in, in moderating increased need. Uh, and then they're talking about the financial pressures about unmet needs, undermet needs and wrongly met needs. Again, you know, in terms of, you know, Richard's telling us a story about, you know, how his needs are being met. And um, and it, it's not just about money sometimes, isn't it? It's about how it's done and where it's done. And I think you were also indicating that in the figures for Cheshire West and Chester. It might be an answer as to why less money has been spent because it's been spent more efficiently um, or, or, you know, especially how and with young people, how is that spent in terms of um, the cost of care and supported living, etc. So I think that's really interesting. But I think what is uh, the point, of course, I would push is that, yes, the voluntary community faith sector has absolutely got a role and we are starting to talk much more seriously to local authorities and to the to our health partners which is all great stuff um and but you specifically said we need to talk to our health colleagues and i'm, I'm just wondering when, when we do talk um we, we, we're sort of well, I'm, I'm, I t I've got a very simple view of this because I'm not into the detail of it and care act funding and better care funding and section 75 is all of which I need to get to to understand um but we're told that the health budgets are really ring fenced before they get anywhere near us. Um, so what opportunities do you think on the ground are there for sharing budgets with our health partners for adult health and social care? And it's particularly relevant at the moment because we're going through a commissioning of a new service for early intervention and prevention that we're calling community led care now. Um, so, you know, and I keep saying and we've got our health partners on that commissioning board. Um, what where can we really share health budgets where 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 are the where are the wins for that okay um i, I probably ought to mention a couple of um ex declarations of interest the first thing i should say is uh, um I, I suspect dale's still with us um uh, i'm actually a trustee for age uk oxfordshire so I, I, I do have, I mean, I, had, I, felt, I think I felt I had a very constructive relationship when I was the Director of Adult Social Services, not sure with the voluntary community sector, um, but I'm now actually on, on the board of Age UK Oxfordshire. So I do have some personal knowledge and, and a commitment to, to the sector. So I ought to say that. The second thing is I did actually, when I was in Oxfordshire, I also had a role within the clinical commissioning group the CCG for uh, a couple of years, actually. So I've got some understanding of how things. I, I think I, I would say uh, I think there's a really important role for the volunteer. So I'd like to say two messages, one about voluntary community and one about the health sector. And I'm conscious Alison's also indicated she wants to ask me a question. So she she may want to come back to me on the on the on the health aspect. Um, in the case of the voluntary community sector, I think there's definitely a role to play the, the way you operate. Um, is, is different to the way statutory bodies operate and that's a real strength. However, I think you've got to think about what works, right? Um, it, 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 the, 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 you could, the, the voluntary community sector can sometimes do some really good things and sometimes they can do some things which actually if it, if it wasn't there wouldn't have as big an impact as they sometimes believe. So I think there's a real question about a hard-nosed evaluation by yourselves about what works and then make that case to both health and social care. And by the way, I've actually said that in discussions within the board of Age UK Oxfordshire. Um, 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 so I'm not saying anything. I'm not. I'm not actually we're trying to. We're trying to do, and I think they would accept that that comment. In the case of health, I would. Um, uh, my experience of working with health is 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 first of all, if people outside adult social care and local government don't understand adult social care that well, I think that's true about health colleagues. But I think it's also true the other way around. 
And I think the best way, you can achieve a huge amount with health. And we had some good, really good experiences in Oxfordshire working with health, which went back many years before I was involved. Um, and that comes by people developing the right relationships and people understanding. So recognising you may not actually really understand things well, but sitting down and working those things through. I think the fact you've got somebody from Health and the Commission is brilliant, by the way. I'm sure that reflects good local working relationships. You've just got to keep working with that. And I think it's important for people outside adult social care to support that conversation because you can get sucked into they should be paying for this and they shouldn't. There's huge financial pressures on the health service as well as for adult social care. I mean, I, I, as a local government person, I would say, actually, they're even great on local government because we're the ones who've had less of the money. I accept that. But there's also huge pressures on health. And I don't think we should ignore those issues. I mean, we need to be sympathetic, talk things through and find out again what works. There are things that can be done which will have a massive impact. You know, the agenda for hospitals has to be about reducing the number of people who need to go into hospital in the same way we want to reduce the number of people who need to go into care homes. Thank you very much, John and Gary, for your question. Um, I've got Richard Lewis next and then Alison and then Lynn. And we are just a little bit behind and I do think we need a, a little comfort break after these questions. So. If I can ask you to be quick and um, maybe we could um, send any questions to John um, in a written form if you if people want to have things they were bursting to ask, but um, uh, we need to get on. So Richard, a question from you. Just very quickly, I, I, I wonder, it go on about the, I'm 46. Right. So basically, I wonder whether there is a need for this local authority to look at when they do reviews, putting putting together a list of the most severe needs. And then, and then exempt them from reviews because their disabilities won't change. I don't, I don't see the point. Well, I do see the point because money has to be, you know, spent and funded and you know the like. I I don't see the point in doing yearly reviews for somebody's disability that has um, <laughs> no change, that is, that is obvious. <laughs> and I'm delighted that uh, I stayed on for this because it gives me a broader picture of what what is actually going on in social care. But this, again, is one of my bugbears. And also, I think the thing with national health, um, we will have to wait till after this horrible virus, you know, is kind of sorted. But I, I can, I want, to see a day because I can't have I I need somebody with me 24 hours a day I cannot have um, <clears throat> I can't be left alone because my my, my medical situation is you know, problem. So, for the most for the most obvious case, for the most obvious cases. But I would also say, I would be very in favour of somebody thinking up a system. I don't qualify. I do on the computer, but I don't qualify. For the NHS funding, we tried about Plita, 
three times and my need don't qualify. So I think there needs to be a system created because I have to go in to University uh, Hospital Manchester every three months to get my tube changed. Yeah. So there is a medical need there. Um, Richard, um, uh, it's not appropriate for me to comment about your personal circumstances because that's obviously something for you to talk through with 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 your with your social work. Let me pick up some general points though. The first yeah. thing is the Care Act's very clear that people's care needs must be met <sighs> in a way in a way in which their um, uh, uh, leads to good quality care. I mean that's very very clear. Uh, and I'm I'm I am actually confident that that's happening in nearly all circumstances. Yeah. I think the second thing I would say is um, some of the things you've raised and were raised earlier on are beyond the Care Act. They're actually about um, the way the benefit systems work, uh, uh, about the support yeah, there is for people who are income slow and so forth. Uh, yeah. the, what I would say is you, you were questioning about annual reviews. I, I think. Uh, 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 um, most directors would say annual reviews are important because it's really important we keep track of people's conditions because if people's care needs have got worse then in those circumstances if their care needs are not met there's a risk that person will come to harm or neglect or right. something like that so so I think I think I would say to you I think it's important it's done it's done, it needs to be done in a proportionate way and it needs to be done well, would be my would be my comment. Yeah, I, I just made Thank that you. comment. I just made that comment because I've had mine recently. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you, um, Richard, for for raising that. And I can see that Lynn Lynn Turnbull's hand is up, and that is going to be. I know Alison's was, but it seems to have gone down, and maybe she could send something in. Um, in writing for John. But Lynn, um, a quick question, please, and then we will take a comfort break. Uh, thanks, Val. It, mine, mine's really quick. I suppose it's just really interesting to see the statistics, John, on the um, spend for older and younger adults. Um, and I just wonder, sort of picking up on the council's budget consultation that's just gone out, actually, whether a proportion of that is the very welcome uh, looking at what sort of level of care is delivered outside of the local area and whether bringing them back to, to receive support within the local community will actually be helpful in maybe reducing some of that spend. Uh, I mean, we don't we don't know the answers to that yet, but as an observation, I think that might be helpful to see that because those costs are obviously much more expensive when people are outside yes. of area and further away. So really interesting to see what impact that has on the level of spend that there are for younger adults and i'm sure del and charlotte have looked at that in more detail but that'll yeah. be really interesting to kind of look at i mean that's that's, pre that's, precise, that's that's a good example of why i think looking at this raises questions it could well be the case that part of the cost is expensive out of what's called out of borough placements um and and i'm there often very unsatisfactory uh, but bringing somebody back in, especially if they were placed a long time ago, because 20 years ago, there was too much of a default option where people went to, um, um, uh, into long stay uh, residential care placements. Thank you very much, John, um, for a really interesting um, presentation, which will lead, I know, to lots of discussion. And um, so I think um, I will just say thank you to you and for all the questions. and. It is now on my clock, it's 12.27, so um, 12.32, can we be back? And I'm hoping that Councillor Coleman and uh, Lisa Redfern are all right to hang on. I've had a wave from Councillor Coleman, uh, so apologies for the delay, but I think we, uh, uh, we do need to take a break and make sure that everybody is fresh to listen to what you've got to tell us. Thank you very much indeed. 12.32.
Hello. <laughs> Hi, Lisa. Sorry Hi. about the delay. <laughs> no worries. No worries. It, it was. Um, I know John, and he's also. You know, it's always um very rich discussion. He's so um yeah. He's Absolutely. got a lot of technical expertise, so uh, yeah, it's yes. helpful like before our session. Uh, well, have you seen that presentation before then or not? No, but I've seen many of John's and uh, yes, I've seen many of John's uh, presentations and he usually presents um, at least annually uh, to the London uh, directors branch. And then we usually have an annual workshop, which you will have in your region as well with John. Yeah with your finance leads and everything so uh, and it's good because he's been a director as well he, you know you've got you've got sort of both sides of it yes. you know it's it's grounded in reality and good knowledge I think I don't know if he's still on the line but um, but yes right okay well it's 12 32 um, and because I've asked everybody to turn their cameras off. I don't know whether you're all that, but I hope so, because I'm looking forward to the presentation from our colleagues in Hammersmith and Fulham, Councillor yeah. Ben Coleman and Lisa Redfern, who is the Strategic Director of Social Care. So I'll hand over to you to make Great. your presentation on the Hammersmith and Fulham approach. We'll Thank do it you. Thank you very much, Rahul. We're very, very, very pleased to be here. Lisa and I are going to do a bit of a two-handed presentation. As, as we said, I'm the Cabinet Member for Health and Adult Social Care at Hammersmith and Fulham, and Lisa is our Strategic Director. She's Director of our Social Care. And um, we're going to have a stab at trying to put these on. Are you going to do it, Lisa, then? I thought I was going yeah. to. Yeah, OK. I'll see if... Um, there we go. OK. We, uh, we've actually just got your email come up. Oh. Please. It's not it's not shared. OK, well, you we should have done. Go? Yeah, you have a go. Apologies. Thank goodness we're not tested on PowerPoint. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Don't know why that's come up. Sorry about that. OK, so I hope that's the slides come up. I wonder if somebody could just come on line and let us know if they have come up. Yes, I can see that. You can do that. I can okay. see it that's too. OK, good. So here we are. Well, thank you very much for inviting us to talk about um, free home care. And we'll do this a bit of a sort of a double hander. I'm aware that I'm the politician and Lisa is the expert officer. So there's some things which are probably better that I touch on and some things that, that she touches on. Um, but the first question we thought we'd look at is why we as a political administration, a Labour Council, took the decision to abolish home care charges. And we took the decision in opposition. We were elected in May 2014 and we abolished the care charges a year later. We'd actually done it um, when we were briefly um, nine years before, before we lost power, and then the Conservatives came in and, and put the charges back up, and they were £12.50 an hour when we um, uh, were elected again in 2014. The reason we did it is perhaps going to come as no surprise to anybody, but um, just to run through those. We feel, that, we feel that charging for home care is a charge on disability, uh, and we worked very, very hard with uh, disabled residents groups before we were elected. And with, uh, we made a commitment that we would try and end this charge on disability if we were elected. It, it all, and we want to try and do a lot of things which perhaps we can come on to, to try and be in, I'm sorry, this is vain, glorious language, the best council in Britain for disabled people. <laughs> you, may, you may want to challenge us on that. Um, but that's certainly our ambition. We also felt that um, the, the cradle to grave promise of the NHS does not suggest that you should be paying for help for home care, care at home. And we thought we, we wanted to try and live up to those values. And people feel that it's not fair. They've been paying into the system all their lives. And why should they have to pay for care at home when they need it? So we felt those three um, moral arguments, if you want, were important for us in not charging any more for home care. And then there's a sort of practical reason which, which comes after those which is that it helps the NHS and if it goes right it helps councils because if you give people the care they need rather than the care that they can just afford uh, the theory at least goes that they should be healthier you keep them healthier you keep them more able to remain independent at home therefore you reduce the need for hospital admission or readmission and which is the NHS cost and you reduce the need for intensive reablement care which is the council's cost so all these reasons um, led us to abolish home care charges um, and we also did other things at the same time. We decided to pay our care workers for travel time and the London living wage. We pay all our um, contractors and subcontractors the London living wage. We have care visits which are at least 30 minutes and often longer. 
we're not restrictive, and Lisa can say more about all of these things if, you, if you'd like to ask when we have the chance to, to, to do questions. We're not restrictive about eligibility. We use a broad definition of the needs assessment, and we expect care providers to have a good or outstanding CQC rating. These are some other things. Um, but Lisa, would you like to say a little bit about the, uh, the cost, the money side? Yeah, sure, sure. I thought you might hand over at the stage, but um, um, hello everyone. I'm I'm Lisa Redfern. Um, so at the time that the uh, administration uh, abolished charges, 1,287 residents were receiving home care. 26% made a contribution, and um, obviously that's I'll, I'll come on to that. This is significant. You know, there's a lot more people in receipt of uh, home care support or direct payments, as you would imagine. But I'll, I'll come on to that now. Um, and the extra cost was a uh, point three point uh, three two four million. Um, so that's that that was the extra cost at the time. Uh, just moving on to the next slide, if that's OK. Um, as I alluded to just then, um, consequently, the demand increased because people can access the care they need and not what they can afford. And again, I'll talk a little bit later about how, how we manage that. There's been a 40% increase uh, in the care that uh, we're providing for head of the local population. And the current home care support budget, which includes direct payments, is £23 million. Pounds. Um, and the extra cost of uh, giving home care, uh, we've calculated to be 650,000 to 1 million per annum. Over yep. to you, Ben. Thank you. Yeah, so if I just go on to the next slide. Um, it, it, so the question is, how do, we, how do we do it and how do we absorb the cost and how do we make it work for us? I think it has to start. It started again, and I'm sorry. This is, I'm speaking as the as the as the politician here. We're very we're very much um, we have fantastic officers to council. We're very lucky. We we particularly um, since the changes we made after we were we were elected, and but it's very it's very very much a politician led administration, and and with fantastic officers to to administer and in, and not just administer to make happen what we're trying to do. So we started because you have to start leading from the top. So we started by setting new council values, um, and these are, and I'm putting them up here because they 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 they, they fit, they're, they're relevant to what we what we did, did in social care, building shared prosperity, being ruthlessly financially efficient is absolutely essential, um, doing local things with local residents, not to them. Often jargon phrase used is co-production, uh, in one sense. Creating a compassionate council, and, and if you don't get the ruthlessly financially efficient bit right, it's very difficult for residents to, much as they in their hearts want to, in their guts accept the things that you might want to do to, to create a compassionate council and borough. And of course, taking pride in the borough and rising to the climate challenge. But the two big ones here, particularly being ruthlessly financially efficient um, and creating a compassionate council, are extremely important. And when we came in, we found that we had a lot of waste in the council um we i mean in the first year it was very easy to it was it was easy to make all sorts of savings we one council meeting we just took all the council magazines put them in the bin and saved five hundred thousand pounds so there was lots and lots of opportunity for us to look at the wastefulness that there was in the council um and we focused absolutely unceasingly on modernizing the council building a top first class officer team bringing in fantastic people with a really really good track record elsewhere we also um did things i mean we are we're very fortunate in being a borough which has the third, third highest land prices in the country. And I know that's not something which is obviously uh, everybody gets um, that, that sort of potential benefit. <coughs> but we also found that the developers who, to be honest, you know, they spend their entire life negotiating with councils. And we found that officers were negotiating with them who had no proper negotiation training. Um, you know, not sort of you want 10, I want five. OK, let's agree on seven and a half much more sophisticated than that. So we spent a lot of um, resource on making sure the officers who are negotiating with developers get really top class training in doing that. And we're now winning absolute record funds. Uh, and that helps the overall position of the administration, although it's section 106, it, it helps. And we were, in a, we were also in an arrangement which was we were in a tri borough, which is something you may be familiar with as a concept, with um, uh, two other councils, Kensington and Chelsea and Westminster. And there were a lot of ways in which we felt that was inhibiting what we needed to be able to do for our residents. So we're not just in adult social care, quite a number of areas. So we left it. 
And that's enabled us generally in the council to be tougher in managing the budget, tougher in sharpening up what we do, uh, much more robust internal financial controls. So all of these things are the background to what we did with adult social care, which I'm going to ask Lisa to say a little bit about. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so how how we do it, how we did it, and uh, the importance of balancing the budget, and you've just been through a rather bleak uh, presentation from from John uh, that I listened to. Um, we've we've had to undertake major workforce efficiencies through system redesign, and I can you know answer what that means during uh, our, our Q&A before but basically try and make sure the money follows uh, the resident as far as possible. Um, focus on better access to appropriate care at the right time and I'll do the next point as well together this this one focus on reablement and we have an award-winning um, reablement it's jointly uh, commissioned uh, with ourselves and our health partners and it's it's an outstanding it's rated outstanding by the Care Quality Commission. And I think um, John talked about it in his uh, session, absolutely critical to have a really strong and mature reablement service that's um, got physiotherapists, occupational health people, GPs, nurses, social workers and so on. So that particularly, and, and I'm sure it's a pressure where, where you are now, um, particularly when people are coming out of hospital and they're very much in need of intensive, you know, continuing their intensive rehabilitation to help them get them back on their feet. Um, and that is also critical to making sure that we're as efficient as possible and it enables us to balance the budget. So um, it, it's very, very important. I can't stress that enough. And I think if you've got, I think, you know, some of the, there's opportunities with integration with health, but there's also some opportunities with looking at, you know, how how you are commissioning your care and are you actually um, investing sufficiently in reablement? And it's not only about the money, it's about the quality, uh, quality of care and the skills that they offer. We've focused and continue to focus on enabling people to live at home. And recently we've co-produced an independent living vi vision and we can, we're can we happy to share that um, after, after this session. And we've introduced regular proactive reviews um, as, as obviously because it, care is free, some people are not so quick to cancel their care when it's no longer required. And I say some, and I also pick up on the uh, gentleman's point beforehand about the need for reviews. I think I think the system around reviews um, does need to be more sophisticated. I think there are some people arguably that their needs are not going to uh, change substantially but there are two reasons for reviews in my opinion um, one is to to actually do at least an annual check with some people more frequently because their needs change quite a lot to also ensure that risk and safety um, are also being looked at and I think that um, continuum around risk and choice and independence is one that constantly needs to be uh, needs to be looked at. Yes, everyone's, um, you know, an adult. However, there are some people who may have capacity issues or whose na uh, needs change quite frequently. So that's, you know, I was interested to hear that point because I do, I do think a more subtle approach is is required, a more sophisticated approach. But at the same time, um, I think it's all, it's it's really important given that more people are living at home, and I think that's the right thing to do and have done for probably over 20 years, um, that people, you know, are receiving the, the right amount of care that they actually need. OK, over to you, uh, Ben. Right, well, um, I think it's one for both of us, really. But I mean, that's yes. that's really that's the essence of what we wanted to say. I can say a little bit, if, if you like, um, about the, um, the work with the disabled people. But um, just to mention here, you know, the question is, we did this fine. Uh, can anyone else do it? Is it is it scalable elsewhere? And um, I mentioned that we have high land values, which is helpful. It, it isn't the killer, but it's it's helpful. Um, we also have a young population, so we have a relatively affluent borough with a young population. Um, that that's one factor. Another factor, which um, perhaps is whether you have the political will to do it. And I know that may sound facile, um, but it is at least. <laughs> Lisa, um, Lisa and I got our, our jobs, my cabinet job and Lisa her job and um, uh, running the show in adult social care about the same time. And it's very clear to the officers that this is what we want to deliver. 
So a lot of what we've done um, is by working with people who are really brilliant at finding out how to deliver and working out how to deliver, like Lisa, has been very, very strongly driven by political will. There is no there is no resiling from this. We're going into the next election. This is staying free. And um, and that's again, you have to really drive this as a political leadership for it to work. Uh, for, it, for it to work, when I say work, I mean the budget to balance and, and you'd be able to make everything else that the council offers continue as well. And when, you know, we still have our parks open, we, our libraries are still open, um, children's centres. So we, 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 you know, there are lots of areas been working hard to, to keep the services going. Um, I would say anybody can make efficiencies. And um, it was quite interesting. Again, you only you know your situation. And it was very interesting to hear John Jackson talking about um, comparative spend expenditure and and the reasons for that. I hope we come out well there, Lisa. <laughs> I was thinking, I'm sure we do. Um, and of course, you know, you'll need to map the need. As, we, as was mentioned, we need to map the need, look at the local resources and a lot of work that would need to be done. So it's not immediately scalable. Um, I would just say, I would say, oh yes, anybody can do it. But I think potentially anybody can if they want to, and if they do that, the, do, do the hard work. Um, so that's really what we wanted to say uh, about adult social care and, why, and how we, why we've made it free and how we've made it free. Perhaps just the last thing I'll, I'll mention, if it would be, um, unless you want to add anything there, Lisa, or... or... No, no, I don't, I don't think so. I, I, I just think it's really important that officers um, and particularly senior officers un understand um, the, um, the policy and also then look at, well, you know, how we're going to make, how we're going to make this work and interpret that and, and work with that. So I, I think it's all you've said, uh, Councillor Coleman. Brilliant. Um, well, thank you. And the, the last thing I just would mention is we touched on our commitment to disabled people. What we have tried to do um, in, in creating policy is we, we've done it through a whole series of, of, of um, commissions. I mean, I, I appreciate to most people, you, you probably recognise that, most people out in the outside world, if you say council, or you say, the only way you can make the word council more boring to them is if you add the word committee afterwards, or commission. But those of you who are in the policy game, and I think we all are here, understand that it perhaps isn't quite as dry as that, because you've set up your own commission, and I can see, I've been looking at the, the all the, the information on paper and what you've been doing, and I'm listening to you today. This is a very energetic, passionate group, and so it is, we, we set up a lot of resident-led um, commissions, which were which were chaired by residents, the members of residents, um, all sorts of things from air quality to business to um, uh, parks, and one of them was disabled people. And it came up with this really excellent report, um, nothing about disabled people without disabled people. And it's it, it made some quite challenging recommendations, among them that we must take the social model of disability, not the medical model, we must stop the UN human rights approach, and also that we must co-produce everything we do with disabled people, which doesn't mean, you know, let's have some ideas and then see what disabled people think of them, which is practically 99% you know, what we talk about when we talk about consultation and engagement. It's we'll have the ideas in a closed room and then get people in to give their views. It means having disabled people in the room at the beginning, coming up with the ideas with together with the councillors and with the officers. And that's I'm not going to pretend it's not challenging, but it's brilliant and we're really delighted. And we brought in the fantastic chair um, of the Disabled People's Commission, Tara Flood, who's a, a national activist, to actually drive the implementation as, a, as an officer now, to drive the implementation through the council. So we hope we'll end up being the most accessible, inclusive borough. So that's what we wanted to say, um, Chair. I hope that's helpful as a sort of uh, starting point. Um, I'm happy to have a chat now. Definitely is helpful. Thank you very much um, for that um, two part presentation, two hander, I mean. Um, and um, I think um, we'll, there is some time for questions and discussion. I'd, I was, I'd just like to come back initially with some um, um, thoughts. Uh, you mentioned, I think, Lisa, about a 40% increase in the take up of care. Yes. Was that an increase in need or was it mainly people who were purchasing their care privately who then came to the local authority? How did that work? That's that's always based on need. And I think um, it, obviously because people do not pay for, for their care, um, I think um, you know, as in other, as in most local, well, every other local authority, for example, uh, people will cease, will get free care for the first six, eight weeks post discharge. Um, that that doesn't happen in Hammersmith and Fulham. 
So that's why we have to make sure that the um, the reviews are managed very, very well at an early stage and that we invest in reablement as well with, with, with health colleagues. OK, thanks, Lisa. I'm going to bring in Alison um, Lee next and then Richard Lewis. Alison. Hello. Um, hi, both. That was really helpful. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm here as the kind of um, NHS rep on the commission. Um, so there's a couple of bits I wanted to um, pick out. I thought uh, the suggestion you've got around those, um, I don't think you use this term, but sort of hard nosed negotiations with developers is absolutely needed. And uh, I'm not saying that that isn't being done here but we we've got you know great housing developments going on in the borough fantastic but some of the promises around health and social care developments as part of that just don't seem to come to fruition and i think you're right some of that is not within the remit of our um director of adult social care to put right but bringing those skills into the, the sort of place side here of, of the borough to, to fulfill what is promised but often not delivered I think is, is absolutely spot on. Um, would like to find out a bit more probably offline about your reablement offer. We're just doing a, a bit of a joint work with our rapid response team which is where we've got the, the GPs etc working and the local authorities reablement team but we're trying that out fairly small scale. Um, so my, I guess my question on that was um, is that reablement service within the local authority or is it is it something you commission externally from an agency or or from elsewhere just interested in your model but you know it sounds great yeah you want me to start uh councillor coleman i'll start hi alison um so it is it is within the it, within the council um and um we uh, work, you know, obviously, as I said, we, we buy we buy that, we invest in it jointly with health colleagues. Yeah. Um, and it's been going for about five or six years now. So it's it's a very, if not longer, it's it's a very mature system. And um, I think we're in the, um, I think we're in the top 4% in terms of rating um, around reablement, getting that outstanding, as, as you all know, is very, very difficult to yeah. achieve. But with that with that maturity and we're also um you know building on that with uh, for example um with some of the one-off grants we're getting over over winter we're just sort of augmenting yeah. that even further which i'm sure you'll be doing um but it but it's critical not just to sort of invest it obviously it's investment financially but to get that skill level and make sure that the whole system is working very effectively together that sounds obviously quite facile and quite um an easy but as as you're well aware i i don't I, I still do i still think we've got an awful lot of work to do at making sure those systems work effectively together absolutely and there's more efficiency there i'm sure as well definitely um, definitely brilliant thank yeah. you both really enjoyed that thanks very much got some more questions um Sorry, uh, I, I think I said, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> um, Richard and then Gary Cliff. Richard. Hello, all. H hello, both of you. Um, I, I uh, two years ago, was involved in the relaunch of the um, system here. I was told quite Kind of got a, a, a quite um, uh, forcefully that the charging system was a legal requirement by the government. My question is, how have you got by that? Because if it's something that they can do here, surely it's something they seriously um they need to look at because it, i mean i i i am so aware of you know do, doing the right thing doing the right thing legally and doing the right thing for disabled people or not just here all over the country and possibly all over the world as well because i know they charge in ireland as well but our family over there um 
Th thank you, Richard. Do you want me to take that, Councillor Coleman? So thanks for your question, Richard, and um, really good question. But it, it's not, uh, it's not, uh, stat, you know, we, we don't have to charge. There is no legislation around uh, charge and we don't have to charge for uh, home care. No one, no, nowhere has to charge for home care. That is interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for clarifying that, that it's um, people can charge within the law, but it's not yeah. a requirement. Is correct. Correct. correct, 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 yeah. Gary. Yes, thank you, Val. Yeah, just interested in, sorry, going back to the uh, the jointly funded reablement uh, you were talking about. Do they understand that you that's entirely done in-house? Do you not um, deal with your community services, the VCFS sector? Just wondering how you involve them in uh, in your in your care arrangements. Yeah, so it's the reablement services in-house, but we work as, well, I co-chair the Integrated Care Partnership, for example. So our community and voluntary sector colleagues are involved in that. And reablement is in, is, is in one of our work streams. We've got four work streams as part of our Integrated Care Partnership. So they're fully involved with that. And I would say the system does, it does involve uh, voluntary and community sector, not necessarily as delivering care, but more in terms of, I don't know, advocacy uh, more more choice and voice i i think uh, that's how it that's how it is uh, certainly in our local authority anyway is that is that, can i just ask a supplementary question is that because you've sure. got a lack of organizations that could deliver or is that a political decision no that's that's the it's it's a lack of organizations who could deliver at present so can i ask another follow-up question in terms of in terms of would you feel that uh, investing in the infrastructure of, of, of community organisations would be something on your agenda too? Um, I, I, I don't see why not. In terms of, in, it, it depends what you mean by by investment, because we invest quite a lot of money in our voluntary and community sector in Hammersmith and Fulham. Um, and um, I think I think in terms of getting involved and um, you know sharing resources and so on, yes. In terms of um, more investment, in terms of financially, that would depend on the delivery offer because we're all we're always open to looking at alternative ways of delivering. For example, uh, our meals, uh, our meals at home service that we deliver, meals in a chat. We've changed it from meals on wheels and changed it from a very big provider to some much more hyper local, uh, smaller organisations in the borough. Uh, we still offer me a meal service. It's at a subsidised rate of two pounds per person that costs the authority much more than that cost the authority about nine pounds per person and um, but we've invested in smaller organizations there so I think what we're keen to do is work to help the local economy help to you know look at what we can do more locally because we feel local is, is, is usually best not in every scenario but that is very much our view and particularly when we're talking about care services I hope that answers your question. No, no, it's interesting. I, I could talk to you about it all afternoon, but I think yeah. Councillor Coleman wants to come in. I know it's a good question. I was just saying it, it is a good question. I think Lisa's point about um, uh, working with people who are in a position to deliver what you want. I mean, the Meals on Wheels is a great idea, a great example, which we've changed to Meals in a Chat, and we're working with six local providers and chat from the charitable sector. Um, and, we do, and we're doing Christmas lunch, for example. We used to do a Christmas lunch at the town hall, not possible <laughs> for people over 60 to be on their own on, on Christmas Day. So we're delivering, I think it's about 800 lunches to people at home, in their homes this Christmas. And we've commissioned a local um, charity to do that with us. And, it's, and half of the money's been provided by one charity, another charity's um, amazing food provider is doing that. So we, we work a lot with, with we, we're putting five million pounds into the community sector this year. Still, we keep we, with a lot of there's a lot of investment made. I'm also trying we're working quite hard to get um, our and this is this is a, a challenge which I think probably officers and, and, and everyone will recognise. We need to produce a procurement pipeline, I think, much more effectively than we do of what we're planning to procure over two or three years ahead so that people who be interested in offering us services can prepare for that. And also we do need to invest in helping people get competition ready because, you know, a small local provider may be, everyone thinks that, you know, Mencap, fantastic local charity, but it has the, it has a weight of the national provision behind it. They have small local providers who don't have the resources to put together proposals to tender and so on. So we're doing a lot in construction with local small, it's not about the third sector, but we're doing a lot in construction with local small firms to get them ready so they can tender for all the construction opportunities coming up. We, we need to do that more with the third sector. 
there is there's always more that can be done but we are looking at this no, that's great. And just to just to follow up, just to finish on that. One. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's not, that's the question I was asking. Actually, yes, are you trying to help the third sector create capacity uh, to be able to help you deliver services in the future? Um, and obviously, something that we're discussing at Cheshire West and Chester. But it's also in comparison the Wigan deal we had a presentation from last time, um, and they sort of like concentrate very heavily on on supporting and, and investing in the, in the third sector over a long period of time, and in effect letting them get on with it. Um, <laughs> And you can imagine that that um, sounds like a great idea from my perspective. But uh, no, thank you yes, very much. It does. I mean, I'm going to be, uh, John, was quite, John was a bit challenging to you, so I'm going to be a bit challenging back to you. The thing is, we sat down with our third sector about two years ago. Um, everything seems two years ago. It was all pre-COVID. So when we had a last big meeting at local theatre with a lot of people from the third sector. And, and, and our chief executive was saying we want to try and work much more intensely and closely. Um, and tell us how you can help us, but please don't use this as an, an opportunity to start asking for more money. Don't start by asking for more money, start by how you can help us. And I would think of the questions, half, half of them did just that, and the half of them said, I need more money. And if that's the way it starts the conversation with councils, without until you persuaded of, of the offer that you can, and you know this, Gary, I can see you're nodding along, until you persuaded councils of the value that you can bring and you just start off with more money and say it, it stands to reason that we should get more. I mean, we have put more money. We put 10 years of funding into our local um, citizens advice, for example. So we, we, we're not averse to we put putting five million a year in, but it's not a good place often to start. And yet it's often where the starting happens. So Thank that's you. for you in working with the third sector, talking to the council. Absolutely. And the challenge is accepted. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, th thanks, um, Ben and Lisa. I, I just I uh, want to take the opportunity just to say to talk about the differences between Hammersmith and Fulham and Cheshire West. I think we're three times probably population size, oh, yeah. um, house and land values nowhere nowhere near uh, what yours are. But it's still a, a really um, interesting thought and also um, thinking about how some people are refusing care because of the charges and the impact that that has um, later on in terms of demand for care and it's we're always trying to get upstream prevention support people um, when they need it and it's um, looking at that rounded picture isn't it we have concentrated and um, your presentation uh, did on providing care free of charge but obviously it's paid for um and a new pay providers uh, in your fees to them um and i'm just wondering in the light of current um challenges and difficulties here with provision of home care care at home particularly what sort of a provider market you have and are they what's their feedback are they people might not be paying for it but are they you know are they uh, well uh, funded for what they are for what providers the home care agencies are doing yeah so i'll 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 start uh council coming if that's okay here so it's, it's a great question and uh, i think like everywhere most places in the country let's put it that way we have a we don't have a strong market with 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 home care but across london and certainly sub-regionally in northwest london we work quite closely with the other local authorities and you probably do the same in in your area to try and look what what we can do to be fair um but also to look at what other measures we need to put in place to ensure uh providers they get the the right funding but also that the the right quality in place. And one of the things that we've done in Hammersmith and Fulham and are doing more of is um, we're co-producing our new uh, home care offer and support at home offer. We've had some conversations over the over the years, a bit less so again during COVID, but um, to look at what what good what good quality care looks like because I think we've still got like everywhere else to do quite a lot with that. And we've placed, for example, um, four quality officers that we pay for into the provide into the main three providers that we use. Um, and we're also working with uh, two of our health provider agencies on looking at building um, a career, uh, a bit more of a career pathway for our carers, home carers, and trying to look at what we can do around upskilling carers. And most recently, we were having a conversation with Imperial, with the chief executive Imperial last week about how we can 
um, how we can build that better bridge between um, acute acute care and care in the community, not just through with uh, with uh, local ICS systems, but including acute trusts as well. How can we improve that quality? So in answer to your question, we work very hard with providers regionally and sub-regionally. We, um, we have worked even more intensively with providers. In fact, we used to do, I think, daily calls during the first three months of um, COVID as well with <laughs> providers. And I think everywhere, again, it was it was about, and I think we've established much stronger rapport since then as well. So we're still keeping up those meetings, not daily, but twice weekly, but we'll step up again um, if things start to um, get hotter in, in the system. And I think we've got much better relationships. We also do a, a monthly provider forum as well, again, all all things which are which are tried and tested but i like to feel that we've got a much more approachable set of commissioners and and a care offer from the council as well as vice versa where we're trying to tackle problems together i think um i i want in my in my kind of vision in our vision a more re a, one that's a more enabling culture and we can only do that with working closely with our reablement service and the home care providers so um i hope that answers your question and we've tried to like everywhere else pass on any grant monies additional grant monies covid monies etc that we've had directly to to the providers or people in receipt of direct payments etc etc um yes. we've also we've also i'm probably I'll, I'll i'll draw it to a close there again i think during the beginning of covid um you know we had these dilemmas of how we're going to encourage carers um who don't don't uh, receive a, a lot of money to get tested how are we going to encourage them to take up the vaccine so we gave them additional statutory sick pay again using some of the uh, grant money and also additional holiday to ensure that they actually gave them the time to go and get their jobs basically um because that so so there are all sorts of things on the ground and some of this is common to to everywhere but some of this i think we got off the ground very quickly um, and I think that was important. And that's stood. I think our relationship with our providers has significantly improved uh, through COVID. Yeah. And you did. I, you know, so if I can add to that, Val, I think that this is an amazing thing. I mean, every talking to the providers, she's been very modest as well, but talking to the providers every single day at the beginning of COVID, which they said no other council was doing, making sure that everybody had free PPE provided by the council, the home care and also the care homes. Um, it's it's these sort of relationships and these sort of things that you choose to do they're all choices there's no rule that says that you can't do them i guess it's just you need to want to do them and and we get much better results as, as, as but it's a lot of it's a lot more work you don't just provide free home care you've got to do a lot of stuff around it i think you can you see that we we certainly develop uh, very close relationships and as you say daily calls with our yes. providers and uh, provided them with ppe although sometimes it felt like we were on the edge of having a sufficient <laughs> supply yes. um, but <laughs> um, so uh, I've just got, I'm just going to take one more question from Lynn Turnbull from our disability positive organization Lynn Hiya Lisa and Councillor Coleman nice to see Hi. you so I'm the co-chair of uh, I'm uh, the chief exec of a um, a disabled people's organisation, but we've uh, six of us have, have joined together. So I'm here as the co-chair of Cheshire Disabled People's Brilliant. Panel, which is made up of six disabled people's organisations covering pan impairment and specific impairments as well. Um, really interesting to hear what you've got to say. I just had uh, two really uh, quick points. So one, I think it was you, Councillor Common, that just talked about the values in Hammersmith and Fulham, and obviously getting the buy into that. So there's generally quite a big shift moving from a medical model focus to a social model focus. So did you have to deliver training um, as a workforce uh, priority um, to get, get that buy-in? And secondly, I think, um, Lisa, you said you'd come to it and you've talked a lot about the home care provision, but how does that equate to the level of provision you've got through direct payments? In Cheshire West, our response to COVID was brilliant in terms of working with the sector. The council were brilliant in terms of how they responded to it and how they worked with the voluntary sector uh, collectively. Um, but it just be interesting. And their first offer from a social care has for a long time uh, 
which we're you know proud of that the the first offer is a direct payment for people to to meet their care and support needs in, in a way that recognizes that it's a, a true vehicle of achieving uh, choice and control um but i appreciate also it's not for everybody so it's really important that you've got the the other frameworks as well um but how how does the home care provision equate to the the direct payment provision because you didn't touch on that so that they were just my two really quick points so one about workforce in terms of the uh, social model and just one about kind of direct payments and where that's positioned from a Hammersmith and Fulham perspective in terms of meeting people's care and support needs. Thank you. Thank you. Should I take the first and you take the second? Yep, Lisa? yep, yes. yep. <laughs> um, the training is a really uh, interesting question, getting people to move away from the medical model to the social model. Um, it, it, getting people in in councils just to consult properly with residents let alone even co-produce with them is quite a challenge um i could, I could get, get everybody getting every, everybody out there in the world getting them to do that is a challenge it's all we're not necessarily all built that way so we i am i, I meet regularly with the uh, under the disabled people's implementation group and with our, our our hr whatever name it goes under these days and and all these people and they're talking a lot to me recently about um, online training. Now we've had as counselors, just the first thing we did is we all had one-to-one, -one, well not one-to-one, in a group training with Inclusion London, which is probably a, a, a group you know of. Um, and that was all about inclusion training. So all about what you're talking about, the social model of disability and understanding that. And it counselors absolutely, it, it's one of those things that when you get the training, you just go, yeah, of course, sounds to reason, but you sometimes need that common sense through through training. So we've tried, I, I think that every officer who is engaged in co-production, which really could mean a large part of our 2000 staff, um, needs to have that sort of person-to-person -person training or these days, Zoom-to-Zoom -Zoom training or Teams-to-Teams -teams training. And I've been having a bit of a discussion with our HR people about whether they, they think, well, we can do great videos for everyone. And I say, great, great videos are great. That's the first point. You've got to have these conversations, even if they're online, with people so it gets in their stomach, it gets in their guts and they understand it. So that's quite a conversation we're having at the moment and I'm optimistic we're going to we're going to get there. But people need to be able to say daft things. They need to be able to say, you know, oh, do you mean this? I'm sorry, I don't quite know how to frame it. And unless they can talk and have a conversation and say daft things and have conversation, it won't change. So we're trying to, I'm very keen on, uh, and, and I know Lucy's supporting that a lot, very keen on that sort of training, one-to-one -one or conversation to conversation not just videos yeah i i um i just nice. echo what what council come and said um so so important to do that training and awareness and just to just i suppose to add a maybe one or two points i think um it also requires i think on top of the training and awareness which i think is a constant you know because because the turnover turnover of staff but it, it just needs to be constantly reinforced so that's also about leading it from the front and it's not a social care issue it's a whole council whole organization issue and that's why we've been very keen and forgive me if 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 this if you already know this that our strategic lead post so that's job shared by uh, Tara Flood and Kevin Caulfield they're at a strategic level and they're deliberately not placed in social care we all decided that it just was too much stigma attached to that and not that I need to tell anyone on this commission but disability is not about social care um, and so they are strategically placed in the council they've got clout it's something they organize you know it's something they argued for and um, you know by having the regular as uh, Councillor Coleman said the the um, disability implementation group from the commission it just keeps it very very live and we still, I would say, in terms of my own workforce or our own workforce, it needs constantly reinforcing both on the macro and on the micro level. So if a manager is supervising their member of staff, they need to be talking about, well, have you thought about this? And have you thought, you know, I mean, that sounds that sounds again, you know, surely that's happening anyway. But I think if someone doesn't have the confidence around this arena, to reinforce that or the knowledge base they won't do it i don't think you can assume it so it requires everyone in the organization to reinforce it and embed it across the organization as well um and and that needs constant so i don't think it's it's certainly not a one-off i know that you know that but it, it requires a lot of um input regular input on the turning to the direct payment question you're probably i don't know what your position is um I, as we're, we're um, 
we, I would say, have about um, two thirds, um, two thirds home care and about a third home care, uh, a third uh, direct payments. And we've got a target for ourselves this year to constantly increase our direct payments. I think that um, it plateaued for a while uh, and they, they, they are going up. Again, we co-produced um, a, a new um, organisation, Action on Disability, to actually uh, get involved and provide uh, the support around direct payments because it's often that setup, isn't it, that's off-putting. I think also the other point, which I'm sure you you know and find that people coming out so quickly from hospital, you know, the the whole kind of emphasis is to get them out of hospital, not to. So you know, it's it's again worth reinforcing with staff that they might not be able to start doing that, but they can quickly introduce that. I think the other problem we face with um, with direct payments, and I'll close on that, is our market's not very strong around direct payment delivery. So I don't want a, a situation where someone feels they have to go to a traditional home care agency. The whole business around direct payments in 1996 was around encouraging people to find carers from, support workers from wherever, so we have to work harder as a service at, at, at expanding that market. And we've got work to do there, I think. Hopefully that answers your question. It does. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. It does. And I, I think um, it would be useful to say now that Disability Positive, Lynn's organisation, we commission them to support right. uh, work with, our, with um, people who want to employ personal assistance and I'm sure Lynn would be happy to have a conversation. <laughs> More than happy. We we link we link up with because uh, that's uh, just across borough as well. So that works yeah. across Cheshire, uh, Cheshire, uh, Warrington, and Wirral. Uh, we also partner with AGK Cheshire, which is important. So to make sure that actually the voice of disabled people is part of that as well. Exactly. Um, in terms of that delivery. So more than happy to have a separate conversation with Lisa about direct right. payments and that approach there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Sorry. Thanks, Lynn. Sorry, Richard here. Just to say, I forgot to say, I'm actually a service user of disability positive. So uh, I know what they do and I'm very good at it. Right. Thank <laughs> that, you. That's a good a good reference. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Richard. <laughs> there. Right. And I think now um, I would just like to say thank you very much to Lisa and um, Ben for a very interesting, informative presentation, which I'm sure will lead to some discussions here um, for us. Um, and I'm sorry, I think we have overrun a little bit, but thank you very much for giving your time. We, with the 10 minutes that we have left, uh, that is scheduled for reflection on the whole session and you're very welcome um, to stay uh, for that, but understand if you, uh, if you need to go. So um, I'm sure we could carry on um, having a, a long, um, much longer discussion, but I think you, we've made a very good start um, to hear about how you are going along this road. And it's not just what we're interested in was isn't is how you've done free home, home care at home, but also um, interesting to hear about your Disabled People's Commission and the other commissions have been on the website and there's some uh, you have some interesting um, stuff there, which I think we might uh, we could find out about. So thank you very much. Indeed. Well, thank you, Val. Thank just, you. Okay. This is very, right. it's very big, and it's kind of say that it's very unexpected to be invited. And the, what you're doing, I think, is is remarkable up in up in, in, in Chester, Western Cheshire. I think that not everybody takes this approach, and as it goes into the level of detail, and it's calling in people from outside, and and really, I was we were very excited to be invited because to see that somebody else is doing and thinking about these things possibly more deeply than us. So we're looking very much forward to, to what you come out with at the end, seeing what we can learn from that as well. So really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thank we'll you. We'll certainly keep you in touch with our recommendations when we when we eventually get round to pulling <laughs> them all together. <laughs> or Morgan gets round to pulling them all together. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Right. Bye. Thank you. Okay, bye bye. Um, right, so open the floor now the virtual floor to any reflections um that people are ready to share now and if you if you want to go away and think about them and send them um to uh, dale for circulation 
No, I'm sorry, I keep calling Morgan Dale. Morgan Dale. <laughs> That's because your names were next to each other on my screen. So, uh, Dale, do you, will you uh, please come in? This is a question for you, Val, mm -hmm. and I'm probably putting you on the spot a little bit, so I apologise for that. What's the appetite for radical change in this space from a political perspective? Um, right, that is putting me on the spot. The reason, uh, the reason I asked that was because I think what Hammersmith and Fulham were saying was that that political leadership was the key thing in terms of making the change happen. So, yeah. But I also understand that it's a really difficult arena to be working in both politically and in a practical and a financial perspective. So I was just, I was just curious. You don't um, have to answer if you don't. Right. I think my my answer to that um, will be around the fact that there would uh, the appetite will be affected by budgetary constraints. Um, but we, you know, we're starting a process of discussing it. Um, I would not want to raise any expectations um, for um, a quick response. Um, I can't see um, the faces of anybody who's got financial responsibilities. Um, but um, we have an election um, a year in May. Um, and, uh, you know, who that there is time for some discussions and we don't it's very early days yet to understand the implications of the white paper of the adult social care white paper the impact of uh, people being able to come through adult social care to have their care commissioned and so I, i'm giving you a very cautious answer dale um but i think it's appropriate not to uh, raise expectations uh, too uh, too high, but I think there are uh, there are as, as I've just said to um, Lisa and Ben, you know the way Hammersmith and Fulham are working um, is interesting as well as the fact that they've chosen uh, to go to free um, care at home, no, not free residential care, and it's uh, free social care, which of course they have done in Scotland and are partially doing in Wales. So it is possible, but without that national agreement, um, I think we'd need to be cautious. So thank you for asking the question, because I think, yeah. So uh, and then I've got um, Gary Cliff and then uh, Councillor Lewis. Yeah, just um, picking up on what Dale has just asked, because um, I, I I think by having the commission like this, as the, as the, the people from Hammer, Smith and Fulham said, you know, they're excited that we're doing it. So I think that shows some radical leadership um, in, in looking at it in the first place. What, what worries me is that by doing a commission such as this and by going through a lot of other things that, that are happening within the council and with, it, with health partners, and I keep on going on about the fact, you know, the partnerships are really, really developing and developing well. It is about leadership. I picked that up from Dale. Um, we've had this before and, and talked about leadership. And it, local leadership isn't about. It's not just political leadership, is it? It's 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 political leadership to want to do, to be willing to do things differently. But then actually inculcating that down. Um, I've said before that you know there's lots of um, members and senior officers that are really um, wanting to do things in a, in a new and exciting and a fresh and innovative way. Uh, but sometimes the day-to-day -day jobs uh, of, of some of the council officers, it, it doesn't seem to be any change. And it, I think it is a, a thing that they did, the, the Hammersmith and Fulham put a lot of emphasis on training their staff, especially when it comes to the disability awareness, etc. Um, yeah, I think that's a lesson we need to uh, to learn, isn't it? You know, it, it, this vision that, that we want to come up with, the recommendations that we make to Cabinet, will need clear, clear leadership and it will need that inculcating down through the whole of the local authority and through anybody else involved. You know, I take on the challenges that have been given um, twice this morning to the voluntary community sector to get your act together um, and, and be able to provide and be able to fit in. Um, absolutely. Yeah. And, and we're hoping and trying to do that. Um, so I think in terms of radical leadership, I think, yeah, I think we are being radical. I think there's some really great opportunities to, to make some great change. Thank you very much. 
Thanks, Gary. Yes, I, I certainly think there is an appetite to look at doing things differently, more um, in a co-production way, um, and that, that there's an interest and an enthusiasm for that, but we need maybe some more detailed um, work on what that actually means in practice, and the training would go along, along with that. So, um, Councillor Lewis. Uh, thank you, uh, Val. Um, I mean, a lot of what Val, uh, Gary said is what I was going to say in terms of the fact that we have committed ourselves to having this commission, uh, which we hope will make a difference. Um, and so therefore, I think that shows that uh, we are a council that is forward looking. Um, obviously, the results of the white paper are going to have an effect. But there was one point that was raised by uh, John Jackson which as a member of the planning committee, um, he talked about having a radical approach to housing. And then that was followed up by Councillor Coleman with the attitudes that they have in terms of how they actually use planning and so on. So one of the things that I think we need to look at is also how the new planning legislation is going to affect us. Um, obviously, a lot of our housing is provided through housing association trusts um, and I don't think we've got as close a working relationship with the variety of uh, housing associations that are now involved, especially here in Winsford. And I'm sure that's multiplied by all the other developments that are going on throughout the borough. Um, so I think that's something that we need to feed into the process. Um, certainly, as far as the financing is concerned, uh, much of what John said, I've already received as um, uh, a self-funder for my husband's care in the correspondence that we've had from the organisation that runs the care home that um, my husband's involved in. Um, I think in terms of what Fulham and, and uh, Hammersmith and Fulham are doing, it would be wonderful if we could actually do some of the things that they're talking about. Um, one of the other things that I felt was 